fantastic lineup of speakers. Not only do we have nine amazing speakers today, but we're also covering a very important source of knowledge, which is books. I know you you know most of them, you're going to get to know a lot of them. When you asked for a favorite book, I did not want to put up my own book. That was incredibly tactical. One week, my co-founder left the company. My girlfriend of three years broke up with me, just dumped me out of nowhere. And my best friend, who I was living with, had a pretty substantial health emergency. I uh, want to start by saying that we're building an amazing community. This is really going to be a masterclass in studio success. Uh, hi everyone, uh, we are starting our third Venture Studio online conference. This time I am not involved as a moderator, so uh, I delegated everything to my team and to our moderators. Uh, but still, my team asked me, my name is Max, I'm an entrepreneur, and uh, uh, for the last year uh, I was doing a lot of stuff around Venture Studios. So we um, created a community for Venture Studios. I'm recording podcast interviews with studio founders. We did three conferences. And before this, I published my big seven months uh, research on studios. This year, we are also doing the research. And uh, yeah, this is our uh, next conference for Venture Studios. So my team asked me to bring two things for this conference. First is books. Uh, so I will show you some of the books. Maybe you already saw uh, on, on my photo. And second... Uh, they asked me to bring nunchucks. I don't know why, but I know, know what to do with them. So I will show you some super skills today. Yeah, super. So we can we can start after this. Masha and Annie are from my team. Are uh, created um, er everything around organizing this conference. So yeah, you can see Masha. You can see Annie. Uh, please, Enya, uh, what will be the next? Hello, everyone. Uh, just a second. Um, uh, not only not only do we have nine amazing speakers today, but we're also covering a very important source of knowledge, which is books. So, with so with so many amazing experts coming to the conferences, we should take this chance and exchange the books that really changed our personal or business life. So, I'm really excited for this topic, and we will come back to this later. And we will also gift several books in the end. So, stay tuned for that. Today, we also as many Max said, we have two amazing moderators, and now I want to introduce you to the first one. And probably many of you already know of her. This is Diana Lissage. Diana has been a driving force in the venture studio space for over six years, taking on roles such as COO, chief of staff, and head of community and content marketing. She currently works on uh, she she works with emerging studios on launching operations and contributes to the space as a thought leader through her blog and weekly industry newsletter. Diana has also created the Venture Studio Database, uh, a comprehensive and accurate database on studios from around the world. So Diana, please, the stage is yours. Hello. Hi, how are you? It's uh, fantastic to be here. Thank you, everyone, for joining the third Venture Studio Conference. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers. I know you you know most of them. You're going to get to know a lot of them, and we're all going to learn so much, as we have with all of the other conferences uh, that Max and the team have put together. So uh, I would you know get ready to take some notes, because this is really going to be a masterclass in studio success. So very excited. Without further ado, I think we kind of want to jump straight in because we have so many speakers and so, so much to talk about. Um, I would love to introduce our first speaker, John Robert Bradford, uh, co-founder and CEO of Colab. Over the past 10 years, Colab has helped start over 100 venture-backed businesses that have gone on to raise an impressive $400 million in capital with enterprise value exceeding $2 billion. 
uh, Colab has achieved seven exits to date and took their first company public in April of 2022, which is very impressive. Um, John is going to talk about how Colab has done all of this and skyrocketed to such success. So John, welcome. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thanks everybody for watching today. I am going to quickly uh, share my screen. As, as Deanna said, my name is John Bradford. I'm the CEO founder of Colab. Uh, we're an LA-based venture studio. Um, to give you all some quick background, we've been in business since 2013. Uh, my partner and I started the business after we actually sold our first company uh, to GoDaddy and found ourselves in the position where we were really arguing for a while about what we should do next. And uh, it was at some point that I suggested that we aim to solve a business that solves that problem for us, just knowing that as entrepreneurs, there would be other ups and downs and in-betweens and wanting to sort of avoid that situation again. And incubator model was kind of the most obvious to us in terms of how we could responsibly work on, on more than one venture at a time. Uh, however, I was 23. He was 21 at that point. Um, we had made a little bit of money, you know, on our exit, but certainly not enough to just invest in companies for the next 10 years. So instead, decided to really invest in ourselves and started by building product in exchange for equity um, of the things that we were doing. And that being said, first venture that we did was uh, Pluto TV, which went on to raise a pretty significant Series A rather quickly as we got involved. As that happened, the um, word sort of got out that we were, were starting to venture build like this with other people. And our wish came true with lots of opportunities knocking at our door. Um, and we've evolved the model a few times over the years uh, to, to make sort of the most sense out of the situation. But uh, yeah, over 10 years in now, as, as already said, we've done more than 100 ventures, um, have had seven acquisitions, and uh, most recently, um, our eighth exit was our first IPO, where uh, my partner and I were fortunate enough to go ring the bell at NASDAQ, uh, which was, was very exciting. Um, here's a few sort of select portfolio companies from the list. Uh, Charge was the company that we most recently uh, did the IPO on. Pluto is definitely the one that seems to be most recognizable and well known. And community is something probably that a lot of you guys have all engaged with at some point. It's, it's largely the text messaging service uh, for celebrities and brands. Um, our investment thesis in, in terms of, you know, when we decide that we want to work with somebody uh, is really asking ourselves, you know, why is this person or why are these people more capable to execute on this concept than if we were just do it on our own? Um, we all, we have been actually industry agnostic. And, uh, if I were to be starting a studio today, you know, not sure that I, I would take the exact same approach. However, uh, it's definitely been sort of a strength and advantage to us having been this far into it, you know, at, at this point and, um, having been done so many different things across so many different areas, feel like we can make a pretty good run at, at sort of any opportunity if, if we really wanted to, uh, however, want to feel like the founders that we're getting the opportunity to work with are that key differentiator in terms of why a business is going to be, um, successful. Uh, large reason that, that we feel so strongly about that, you know, a notion that, that I feel strongly about is that founders actually shouldn't wear a lot of hats. And that's because you are only as strong as your weakest link. And, um, yes, that to me implies that, uh, there's potentially somebody working on something that there's somebody more qualified to be doing, uh, you know, that particular task. So we're all about placing the highest caliber people for any size job, you know, as it, as it makes sense uh, for a startup on their, their path. And I would say uh, another thing that's maybe a little bit more unique about us is as much as we do provide the fractional support, you know, on sort of a consulting type basis as these, these things are getting their own footing, 
uh, we're also the first ones to admit that, um, you know, this role has really become full time and it's it's time to recruit for that position and oftentimes help either transition, you know, folks from inside our organization or recruit from from inside of our network, uh, which having done 100 ventures is quite vast and, and enables us to bring in some very high caliber talent that uh, others wouldn't typically maybe get access to. Um, we really believe that, uh, uh, considering the marketing and go to market strategy is, is a very important piece in terms of how and why we develop products and place a large emphasis on brand, you know, of the things that, that we, uh, uh, get involved with. Um, and this is something that we've actually more so evolved into. We, we have primarily been product people, you know, as, as we've gotten our, Art, and that's that's really why my co-founder and mine's background. But uh, one of the partners that we've added to the business over time um, was actually one part of the founding team of Activision, and in particular, the part of the 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 CMO uh, of when Activision launched, who eventually uh, spun out his own agency of Activision, and and has done marketing for very large scale, you know, brands and and all types of things. And um, yes, provides really sort of a whole very well-rounded, you know, opportunity. Whereas before we would build a product to achieve a certain, you know, market fit and then think about marketing sort of afterwards, uh, bringing sort of that discipline into things up front um, definitely helps us inform a lot of the the product making decisions that, that we do in the beginning. Um, Similar process, I'm sure, to how you know many other studios uh, work, but we sort of think of things through three different phases. Which phase one is really venture validation, which leads to to product development and eventually go to market and scale. Um, a lot of our concepts don't make it past the venture validation, you know, phase, and and we sort of think of that as as really the dating period that that we're seeking to have with both the entrepreneurs and the ideas that that we're working on. Uh, and then as we get sort of through that and, and feel more strongly about it is, is when we, um, you know, really take our position in these companies and, and cement uh, the partnerships uh, moving forward. Uh, our business model, um, unlike a lot of groups, we have never raised any money. We've, we've been bootstrapped from the beginning. It's all been based on sort of our reinvesting into uh, the things. And although we occasionally do invest in startups, we actually don't invest in startups that we're working on. Um, we feel very strongly about the importance of having sort of outside investors to provide even a larger network of opportunity in terms of helping, you know, build these things. And uh, uh, also, um, uh, do charge fees in line with sort of the cost of of having these this roster of of high caliber folks able to be deployed. But uh, where we think that that you know really kind of helps keeps incentives uniquely aligned is we as Colab always take the same share class as founders and always working with outside investors. The founders can feel very you know reassured that as we're negotiating and helping raise capital for these things. We're obviously going to try to get the best terms for for us, you know, as we can, which would imply that we're always going to be trying to get the best terms, you know, for them as well. Uh, at the same time, you know, uh, we could be working on a multitude of other things, either for ourselves or for high paying people that that would seek to just sort of hire us as as normal sort of high price consultants and we're sacrificing that opportunity cost making us really ongoing investors in the company as it continues to grow uh we think that this is a a, a special way of and 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 important way of doing it you know in terms of of what's been successful for us because it has really enabled us to talk to both founders and investors as either founders or investors. Um, as, as I'm sure some of you know, you know, uh, investors will oftentimes just be looking at the numbers and, and suggest that a change, you know, may need to happen. And we're able to sort of reassure in some cases, like, hey, we're, we're on the ground floor and 
give it a few months, things will be, you know, all right. And in other cases, we're also able to say, hey, in a few months, you're going to want to make this intervention. Let's let's go ahead and, and make it now um, so that we can kind of just speed up the process of both success and failure. Um, we've largely partnered with other investor groups and been sort of their, you know, hands-on support as they all are hands-on in their offering, um, and work with a lot of family offices in particular, uh, but also venture capital firms and, and some corporations and, and, uh, educational institutions. Um, a more recent notion that we've started to explore and think about and, and think is interesting is, is something that we've come up with that we consider the, or we've been, been calling the safer note, uh, which is what we feel is sort of a way for investors to say maybe. Uh, after interviewing a lot of you know VCs on, on the topic of what is the percentage of hard no's that, that they feel they must say you know, to opportunities, the response has has often been somewhere between 75 and 80 percent, and there's been no mechanism really for them to explore things further. What that has done is led to a lot of opportunities where then we get introduced to those people from those same investors, and we've always been very appreciative of that opportunity to explore those opportunities. But at the same time, they're essentially sending us, you know, an unfounded startup in hopes that we can get it to a place where they feel more comfortable to actually deploy capital. So with the notion of the safer note, uh, it is very similar to a safe note in general. However, as opposed to having a market cap, it actually has a, a, a market or a price floor. And it's a, a promise to the founder that, listen, we're interested in investing a, a larger you know, amount of money, but here's a smaller amount of money. And we promise that on the other side of you taking this and going through a venture validation phase with CoLab, uh, we will either make an investment of, you know, for a minimum valuation of at least this much or uh, decide not to move forward, you know, at all, in which case the founder walks away with essentially an uncapped note. But they can have some reassurance that if they take this this sort of investment from the, the group that they're not going to come back with an offer for, say, 50% of the company or, or something along those lines. So a little bit of reassurance to the founders um, as they're sort of taking on that money to essentially engage us uh, to further kind of refine the opportunities and then represent them to the, the investors on the other side. And uh, piloting that right now with, with one of our partners and, and chairman, uh, Josh Jones, who was uh, formerly the founder of, of DreamHost and and most notably one of the earliest people to be involved with Bitcoin um, and also an alumni of Harvey Mudd that uh, uh, has overseen sort of their accelerator program. Um, but we're also thinking about, you know, how to further sort of enhance this concept and exploring this concept of a, a joint venture with several of the LA focus VCs and family offices uh, to create essentially not a, not a fund, but a joint venture where we would be able to pool these sort of maybe type situations and even hedge each other's bets as um, we're choosing which ones to kind of work on uh, moving forward. And that is co-op. Thank you so much. That was fantastic to hear the story of the evolution and how you kind of structure things that is a bit different than what we've seen kind of in the traditional model. Um, and to that point, there was a question in the chat to make sure I understand you don't have your own fund to invest in startups. You syndicate at uh, precedes at seed stage. Is that correct? We actually just help raise and, and really are in the trenches, you know, with the founders and um, again, have done some syndicates for other deals that we feel don't need our support as, as sort of a, a venture studio, but are really um, strong and, and have held strong to the idea of investing either sweat or capital and uh, invest in the the opportunities that, you know, we see or feel are uniquely qualified and, and couldn't benefit, you know, from our support, but have used it as a way to sort of hedge our bets as well and uh, encourage our friends to invest otherwise in, in our ventures so that um, we too will invest in theirs and uh, 
yes, it just creates a a further sort of team and, and network, you know, to, to provide opportunity. That makes sense. I think it's that speaks to the importance of developing investor relationships in that investor network, which is really critical to the kind of the resources of venture studios. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. I definitely learned a lot. I think everyone else did. We're going to move to the next uh, section of the um, of the conference today, which um, I would take a little bit of time to share a little story because the theme of this conference is books. Um, and I was asked to hold up some of my favorite books, but I can't. Um, <laughs> this is because last year I was moving and my Jeep got stolen. And you're like, what does that have to do with books? Well, in the back of that Jeep was a single box full of all the books I've ever collected throughout my entire life. Um, and I... It was too heavy to bring inside. I left it in the car. It was like the last thing I had to move inside. It was getting dark. So I, yeah, I've seen some like emojis. I know it was devastating. Um, so the car gets stolen. The books are in the back. They recover the car. And when they told me the books, the box of books wasn't in the back, like that's when I started crying. Like I didn't even care about the car. I was just like, that's my entire collection of my books through my entire life that I've like made notes in and like the evolution of my interests over time. So I was really, yeah, I was really upset. But so after, since then, I've been kind of trying to buy back some of the most beloved books from that former collection. And the first one I bought, which is the book that I will show you today is, I don't know if this is backwards on your screen, it's backwards on mine, but it's called Farsighted by Stephen Johnson. Um, I bought this one first because it's so applicable to what we do in the venture studio space, which it's, it, it's a book about kind of stories and things about different you know, organizations, governments, just different stories about how people have had to kind of systematically make complex decisions. Um, and there's throughout the book, there's lessons through stories that are kind of tactical frameworks for, I would call it like future casting. So you kind of understand the impact of a current decision and what that might have kind of in the future. And then you can kind of chart your course accordingly. So I, I very much recommend that book. I'm looking forward to buying back the rest of my collection um, and looking forward to everyone's book suggestions here today. So I can maybe add to uh, those purchases. And I think we're going to get back to our, our regular programming because the next speaker is really going to blow you away. He's somebody you probably already know. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome T.A. McCann, Managing Director of Pioneer Square Labs. He is a serial entrepreneur with some of his startups having been acquired by the likes of Google and BlackBerry. He's an active angel investor, a Techstars mentor, and he has uh, built and he's a pioneer in the venture studio world. Um, speaking of pioneer, Pioneer Square Labs is a startup studio that's created over 20 companies with six exits to date. And PSL Ventures is a VC fund that's raised 80 million in 2018 and 100 million for their second funds. A lot of money. And today, TA is going to deep dive on a topic that I know this audience in particular is going to love fundraising for venture studios. So let's get straight into it. Welcome, T.A. McCann. It's so fun to be here. No matter how long I do this, I'm always just amazed that, oh my gosh, there's just so many more people doing all this venture studio work. It's incredible. And thank you for putting everybody uh, together. So I'll try and stick to my 10 minutes. It's hard to do all of these topics uh, for all of us who've been working on studios for so long. Uh, all of these topics in an abbreviated sort of way, but I'll, I'll do my very best. Uh, so as you uh, mentioned, we are a venture studio based in Seattle. Uh, we've been around since 2015. We've raised $47 million for the studio and $180 million for our two different venture funds. So we've done a lot of fundraising uh, over the, the last couple of years. So you can update your, your numbers there. We just raised Studio 3 in January. That's a $20 million raise for our third studio entity. Um, and in terms of ideas, we've actually tested around 420 ideas over that period of time. And we just spun out our 36th. Then next week, we'll be on our 37th uh, company. All of those companies have been successfully venture funded. And as you mentioned, we've had a number of exits along the way. An important part that I'm going to talk about in terms of the fundraising is really about the team. And I wanted to highlight a couple of points on our team. So we do have the venture and the studio. 
uh, the three people or four people across the top being myself, Greg, Jeff, and Julie <clears throat> are all important components to the narrative around the studio or the founders of the studio. Uh, so as you mentioned, I'm kind of the operator persona being most of my time being a, uh, a founder and building companies. So I'm a five-time founder, three successful exits. So I'm, I'm kind of the builder person. Greg and Jeff are really the strong investor people. So Greg Gottesman was one of the founders of Madrona, our largest VC here in Seattle. He's been a VC for over 25 years, invested in tons and tons of companies. And Madrona was the first uh, VC investor in Amazon, as an example, and many, many other successful companies here. So Greg has a long track record of successful investing. Jeff, uh, my other partner, is the most active angel investor in Seattle. He's invested in over 300 companies as an angel investor and had many, many exits along the way too. And then Julie was at Amazon uh, for a long time as a product manager there. And then she joined Madrona too. Greg recruited her to Madrona. And then when we raised our first venture fund, Julie came over to manage here. Uh, David, Paul, v, Ben, Mike are also important components there. But as we start talking about raising capital for your studio, I think John made a couple of good points there. When you have people who have proven that they know how to make other investors money, it's a heck of a lot easier. And you can make people, other people money by founding companies and selling companies and having investors, of course, in those companies, or you can do it as a co-investor with them as Greg and Jeff uh, have done many, many times over. So to the extent that you have a track record, um, it's a heck of a lot easier to raise money. To the extent that you have a track record with specific people, it's a lot easier to raise money again from them. Both, um, I'll talk a lot about Brad Feld along the way. So Brad Feld was one of the um, founders of uh, Foundry Group out of uh, Denver or Boulder, Colorado. He's also one of the co-founders of Techstars. He's also a widely written author in the category of entrepreneurship. Uh, Brad was one of the investors, lead investors in one of my companies, GIST. And Brad is the lead investor in both our studio and our venture fund, having worked with Greg over many years as well. So Part of the success that we've had on raising capital is our own individual success, but probably equally important is our relationship and long-term relationship with Brad. Now, I'm going to try a new way of presenting, and I'm happy to, once I expand all of these through the conversation, I'm happy to send you a screenshot of all of this uh, so you can take notes or, or I'll send it to you when I'm finished. So, as you think about raising capital for your uh, for your particular studio, I'm going to try and cover in seven minutes or less or six minutes or less the category of who are the founders, what is the structure, what is the motivation for the investors investing in your particular studio, details of the round, so how much and when, how to build your target investor list, finding your first great founders, focus areas for the spin outs you're going to create. And then I may get to other examples uh, of different studios who've also gone through something similar like this. So the first part of this is, can are you a founder with a successful investing track record? This is the point I just made about myself or Greg or Jeff or Julie. Um, I highly encourage I me. Mean, I talked to a lot of early stage uh, uh, founders of studios and go find your own Jeff interests. I call this a structuring partner somebody who wants to think and really enjoys the process of thinking about structure. And structure is, are you going to have a hold co or an opco or a venture fund or not? And what's the ownership going to be? All of the legal stuff that's required there. I personally am not that good at that, but I'm very, very lucky to have somebody like Jeff and Greg who are very good at it and very interested. Both of them are attorneys as well as being venture capital investors. Also in structure is find yourself a good attorney. So we are very fortunate to work with Wilson Sonsini, uh, and specifically David Wickwire uh, and Craig Sherman. Those two people with Jeff and Greg are, were very, very instrumental in figuring out the appropriate level of structure for our particular studio. And then, as I said, in this process of building structure, find your lead investor. So as PSL was coming around, Brad and Greg and Jeff and David were all spending time on what is the right way to think about the structure of the studio? And there's lots of components to structure. There's who's going to own what? How are we going to get paid back for it? How are we going to think about taxation? How are we going to think about moving money between the investors, the LPs, the GPs, et cetera? So there's a lot of value in finding your own Jeff interests. 
Um, and I'm just going to pick on him as one particular persona. Okay. Within the structure part, and I know we a lot of different venture groups, um, you know, other others spend a lot of time on different types of structure. However, figuring out your own structure will be very important in raising money. So are you a hold co? Are you an op co? Are you a venture fund? And how will the returns that you're going to create from your studio end up creating returns for investors? And I highly recommend that you spend time thinking that through with a couple of examples. And you would say, okay, well, we're going to create a company. We're going to own X percent of the company. The company is going to go through this many rounds of financing. Then it's going to get this too much dilution. Then we're going to make some of our return. And how will that all flow back to a particular investor? When you're talking with an investor, your ability to talk in both the structured way, but also a specific way increases your chances of raising capital. How will you have in income or expenses? Some studios do. I think John just made a very good point that they have income, right? They're charging external companies either in the form of cash or they're charging them in the forms of cash and then exchanging that for equity. That's a very viable way to do it. But there's lots of other ways by which you may end up creating income. So you may choose fees from the spinouts themselves. You may get corporate fees. So there's plenty of studios out there who build themselves or bootstrap themselves out from working with corporations. Are you recycling from your exits at some point and how will you do that? And or if you're going to raise a venture fund, are you going to use some of the management fees in order to fund the studio? And this is something that we do at PSL because we have both of those entities. Is there anything unique about your location? Um, so there's studios from all over the world here. Uh, there's certain things that we can do to make it more attractive for investors in the United States. There may be many things that make it more attractive for you in other areas. I take one example here in staffing credits like the Shred program in Canada. So if you'd use that program really, really well, you can basically get a lot of money back from the government for these companies that you're creating, thus extending the life of the studio and making it more attractive for your investors. So explore the ways that your local or your country issues may create unique opportunity as part of your structure and process. How are you going to own? So depending on what you perceive you're going to own, it changes the economics quite dramatically. So some studios out there take 25%, some take 70%, some take 50%. So how much are you going to own of the studio spinouts you're going to create? And then how much is common and preferred? We've learned a lot about this over time and continue to modify this sort of balance between common and preferred ownership um, when you're thinking about the studio part of it before we get even to, into the venture fund. But getting some sense of that goes back to the point I made previously about the waterfall and the waterfall going back to an investor and understanding a specific example. And if you take 40% versus 50% or 20% or 70%, you will attract different kinds of founders. You will attract different kinds of investors and you will create different return profiles. And if you, are, if you are going to do a fund, then how do the fund work with the studio? Who manages it? How do fees flow back and forth between those particular entities? My strong recommendation for most of you is that if you are getting started, do an operating company, a hold co or an op co. Do not worry about a venture fund and the two and 20 model and do that later like maybe year two year three year four once you've got some momentum on the studio itself okay let's collapse that area now let's talk about motivations for the investors and i would try to do them in this order i would look for investors in the order of first of all people who have personal connection with the studio founders i mentioned brad he happened to be an investor but brad and i and brad and greg and brad and jeff been working together for many 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 years and we've returned lots of money to Brad already. So the personal connection that he had to us, each one of us, uh, was an important part of getting the PSL studio up and running. Do your investors have a locational or community interest? So these are oftentimes people who are wealthy individuals, family offices, individual successful entrepreneurs, et cetera, who um, care about making your particular geography more successful, more entrepreneurial. Third is intellectual curiosity. Are they just geeky about how to build companies? I think John, myself, people who are past founders, they're like, oh man, I made so many mistakes and wouldn't it be so cool if you could build a machine so that all the next founders wouldn't make so many mistakes. So the first three people, the first three topic areas are generally not that 
are not that interested. They're not overly indexing on recurrent return. They're indexing on something else. I want to support you. I want to support this area. I want to be interested in what you're doing. And they may have an interest in a domain focus. So they're like, you know what? There's a gigantic opportunity in e-commerce at this point in time. And I'm interested in building many, many companies in e-commerce. And therefore, I want to invest in a vehicle that will create lots of companies in e-commerce or fintech or health tech or you pick your thing. Below that is obviously some level of financial returns. But when you immediately are into the discussion about financial returns, you are almost always not going to get a yes. Um, it's very difficult unless you have a very strong track record because it's you can't prove that you know what you're doing. You can't prove that it's going to have a good financial return. And if you're talking to an investor, you go, well, call PSL or call John or call High Alpha or call someone else and look at their returns, then that, that does not necessarily suggest that that's going to be your returns. So the person who's financially motivated, too financially motivated, is not likely to invest that early. And then the last is future deal flow. So sometimes you will find family offices, small seed funds, VCs who will want to invest because it's going to be deal flow for them. However, most VCs will not because they don't want to, they don't want to have to deal with carry on carry. So they have carry, we might have carry. So, or they may have a limited partner agreement that won't let them invest in these things, but focus your time on these kinds of details for investors. Round details are relatively straightforward. I recommend that you raise smaller amounts of money. But if you say, hey, I'm going to raise $3 million or $5 million or whatever it is, that's going to raise for this amount of time. I'm going to build this number of ventures across this particular category. So I'm going to build five companies over the next two years. Two of them are probably going to be e-commerce. Three of them are going to be fintech. My area is very focused there. So focus on a relatively short amount of time, preferably three years, maybe five years. And then what am I going to build? So I'm going to go hire Joe and Mary and Sam. I'm going to build a team of six people. They're going to have these kinds of skills to support my e-commerce, healthcare, fintech, whatever category. This will be probably straightforward for any of you who are founders or been through this, or certainly will be straightforward when you go talk to your different spin outs is how do you go build your target list? Focus your time on the lead investor. The person is going to write the biggest check. The person is going to negotiate the terms. Then you'll have these follow-ons, angels. And then once you have leads and follows, they bring some people who are what I'd call random, meaning you didn't know them. They were on your target list, but uh, you're going to end up ultimately raising capital from them. Essence of time, I want to be respectful of the rest of the uh, group. But one of the most important things that you can think about and narrate here is how are you going to find great founders? Is that coming from your geography? Is that coming from your network? If you can find great founders, I mean, great founders, the rest of your life is easy. And as an investor in studios, I might look at you and say, tell me about the first three founders you're going to work with. Why would they work with you? Why would they do this versus doing lots of other things that they could do? So finding your great founders is important. What areas are you going to focus on and why are you particularly good at it? And in that area, this is something that's important for us. So we look at sometimes why why would we why would you want to invest in the Pacific Northwest? I, why because we have places like Amazon and Microsoft are recruiting incredible people who want to go do startups. And what is going to be the focus area of your particular studio? The more you tie these things together in terms of who you are as founders, why you're going to win, how you're going to attract great founders, what process you may or may not use, will increase your likelihood of raising capital quite significantly. And again, I will do the fully expanded version of this and I can send out a PDF uh, version and hopefully that was helpful. That was incredibly tactical. I know everyone in the audience really got a lot out of that. There were so many kind of comments of like, we need that Mira board. Can you share the link? And so, so that's great. He will, he will share the PDF after. Um, I think we have time for one question. Um, I kind of wanted to to ask a little bit, just expand a bit on um, what you mentioned earlier, which it 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 follows the advice that I typically when what I've found when working with emerging studios. You said studio should typically launch as a hold co and kind of wait to launch a fund until years two to four, um, which I think is realistic and makes a lot of sense. But what would you say are your kind of top recommendations for revenue generation in the meantime? Like, how have you seen studios successfully kind of bootstrap? Between well, 
so there's difference. There's a difference between a bootstrap and raising. So bootstrapping be very different, right? I think John gave very good examples of how you might do that <clears throat> effectively as a consulting firm. And then you might be trading, you know, initially it's mostly cash and a little bit of equity, and then it's a little bit more equity and a little bit more cash. And then at some point in time, you're doing all the work for just equity, which is the way most studios work. If you are going to uh, think about revenue and you're not going to do corporate, which there's plenty of reasons to do it and plenty of reasons not to do it. We have a couple of corporate partners now, but we, we only did that when we were like five and a half years in. We really mm-hmm. understood our process. We knew what we could sell. We knew why we were differentiated. And now we do have a couple of corporate partners, but only later in the market. So the most common way in which you generate revenue is basically back from your startups. So you start a company, it stays in the studio for a while. And then as soon as you spin that company out, now, effectively, if they want to keep using your resources, then you're like a consulting firm. That's what we do. And you may build them back in different kinds of ways, but that is a way in which you are generating revenue. And, and it sort of creates an internal tension between how long do I keep it in the studio? And then when do I spin it out? However, you then need to be very good at raising early capital for that company so that they can pay you back for the fees that you might charge them, which is a lot of the reason why people end up raising a fund is it's difficult to raise, to, to put money into the company straight out of the studio. Hmm. So you have to have a very friendly set of investors, either yourself as a friendly investor or a friendly set of investors who really like the kind of companies that you're building that will therefore fund them. And I like John's idea of a yeah. safer note and the ways in which people are thinking about funding on effectively day one of the companies. And if you can successfully fund the companies, the spin outs on day one, you have a higher likelihood of being able to generate effectively revenue from consulting fees back into the studio. Yes, that makes this sense. This is also is also sorry to interrupt. This is also very important like when you think about structure going back to my first point is like what is the structure of the studio and how would you recognize said revenue as well as how will you communicate this value to the founder right that you're trying to retract and there's a lot of ways to to go about that too. I I couldn't agree more. I think that the resources of the studio matter a lot. And then to John's point and what you just reiterated, the investor connections that you're making for your portfolio companies, super important. And I love how you broke down what uh, kind of in order of, imp- not in order of importance, but in order of um, likelihood of success, kind of what to, who to talk to first. Um, so that was, that was super incredible, tactical, really critical uh, information. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I think I think Annie is going to take over at the uh, at this juncture. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Just for a minute. Don't worry, Diana is not leaving us yet. But I want to connect for a minute to take a group photo all together. We asked you before to prepare your top three favorite books that signif- significantly affected your personal or business life. So as you know, we can't have a Venture Studio online conference without a group photo. So let's uh, create some memories, uh, please. Uh, now I ask everyone to turn on your cameras and hold up your favorite book or maybe several favorite books, as many as you can fit in your hands. And let's just smile and let's hold it for like 10 seconds so we can have, uh, we can make screenshots of all of the pages. <laughs> all right, three, two, one. And smile. Don't forget to smile. <laughs> Yes. Great. This is amazing. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So since we're already holding them up, I will ask you now. So now is the time for the book exchange uh, moment in the chat. So please write in the chat what is your favorite book or books. And maybe you can also include why you love it so much and how it changed your life. So while you're writing that in the chat, let's uh, continue. So I'm giving the mic back to Diana. So moving right along, I am really excited to present our third speaker, Alex uh, Hollander, uh, Vice President of Strategic Communications at Juxtapose. Alex has a really unique background. She leverages her journalism and marketing background to elevate Juxtapose's brand and help their portfolio companies tell their stories. Uh, Juxpost was founded in 2015 and has developed over 15 companies and raised $450 million to date. Um, today, 
Alex is going to talk about a topic that is actually near and dear to my heart, marketing. Uh, Specifically, she's going to deep dive on how to develop your studio's brand and the strategies you'll need to effectively market your firm and your portfolio companies. Uh, I think you're going to leave this session armed with skills and ideas for identifying your key audience, choosing your communications channels, sharing your message, all of the things that go into building a brand uh, for your studio. So welcome, Alex. Thanks so much. All right. Well, thank you so much for the intro, uh, introduction. It was very comprehensive. Um, I'm excited to talk to you guys today um, about PR. And, um, you know, similarly, this is going to be a really tactical session um, focused on, you know, how you can sort of go from not knowing anything about how to tell your story in the media to, you know, being able to uh, set up a launch for yourself um, and begin developing relationships uh, with media. So first, I'll just tell you a little bit about um, Juxtapose. So we are the largest investment firm focused on company creation. We call ourselves a creation-oriented investment firm, um, but we, you know do sort of uh, touch the category of studio, of incubator, of accelerator. Um, We have a somewhat unique approach. Um, Kind of the first component of that is we build all of our companies in-house with our in-house team. We're a team of about 30 people. And we have a concept development team, a user research and design team, a talent team, um, and then, of course, other business functions. Um, We spend a really long time developing our concepts and de-risking them, kind of using all of those different, um, you know, areas of expertise. And, you know, we'll, in in the course of a year, we'll maybe start, you know, with, uh, you know, 100 to 200 ideas top of funnel. And then we actually only end up building a few a year and we deploy significant capital into each one. Um, The other kind of different part of our model is that we partner with really experienced CEOs. So we have this, you know, very specific thesis that says, um, you know, the way our companies are going to be successful is dependent on the caliber of CEOs and the caliber of CEOs, um, you know, our, our sort of uh, criteria are, we want them to have held leadership positions in public companies before, you know, we want them to have experience running all different parts of a business. Um, And so, you know, contrary to, you know, the typical founder, you know, who's maybe in their 20s, um, maybe, you know, they've uh, started one company before two companies, or maybe they're brand new, where we tend to be working with people who are, you know, in their 40s, 50s, Um, they've had a really incredible career. And they're now looking you know, to take their sort of like last big swing um, and actually found a company with us. So, sorry. Um, This is kind of an example of the coverage um, that we get. So like I mentioned, um, we've had, we had this piece kind of more recently on um, our CEO thesis We've done press when a new partner has joined, which you can see on the right, and Business Insider, and then obviously around um, fundraises. So we'll talk a little bit more about different moments that make sense for um, getting press, like as a studio and for your portfolio companies. But this is just sort of an example of the kind of moments we choose to engage with media. And then before we get into it, um, I'll just tell you a little bit more about my background. So um, Diana uh, covered it really well, but I I got my start at Facebook um, on the communications team and spent 
four years there, then spent four years at Instagram working on um, product and innovation communication. So uh, focused on telling the stories about how we were building. And I worked with a lot of um, startups actually that had been acquired um, and had their uh, companies kind of spun into Facebook and Instagram products. Um, I took a year off when I quit in 2018. And then um, I decided to try consulting um, because I was sort of, I'd done sort of the same thing my whole career and I wanted to um, get exposure to different kinds of companies. So here you'll see kind of a smattering of the different companies I consulted with. Um, they were all uh, or primarily early stage companies. I would help them with their brand identity development and um, their funding announcements and sort of launches into the world. I also worked with some growth stage companies, Pinterest and Niantic, um, just working on telling this, you know, their sort of product stories. Um, so, so really, so at this point, like really varied uh, ex exposure to um, different industries and different founders and uh, kinds of companies. And so I joined Juxtapose a little over a year ago, um, just really excited to both uh, work on behalf of a sort of core brand, but then also get, you know, the, the experience of working with um, different uh, portfolio companies. So where I want to start this uh, presentation really is around understanding the media. So if you're not, uh, you know, a reporter or a comms person, um, or, you know, you're not reading, you know, tons and tons and tons every day, um, it's, it's hard to understand exactly how the media operates. Um, it tends to be very nuanced. Um, and, you know, everybody has a great idea. That doesn't mean that everybody's going to get coverage. So it's really important that you kind of understand um, a reporter's motivations as you're thinking about how you're going to tell your story. So I, I think the biggest thing to know here is that reporters are gauged um, on engagement on their articles. And, you know, that ties into the whole financial model, et cetera. There's also other elements, you know, reputational elements. Um, you know, each publication has sort of a different um, angle. And so um, our job when we're trying to uh, work with media to tell our stories is to help reporters, like help them be successful. Like it's not about, you know, hey, like we're doing something cool. like right about us. It's like, we're doing something cool. We want to help you uh, tell better stories, whether, you know, you're, you're actually telling a story about us or, you know, maybe in the future, you'll be working on kind of an industry or trend story and you'll remember, oh, like that, um, that firm focuses on healthcare. Like I should ask them about what they're doing. So it, it really is about this sort of cooperative relationship rather than something transactional. And the way you create um, a, a good relationship is by bringing them good information. And so we'll dive into this uh, more deeply, but the kind of four markers of a relevant and actually reportable story are that it's newsworthy, it's novel, it's notable, and it's actionable. So um, newsworthy. So the way, you know, and, and this is kind of obvious, but the way that reporters prioritize how they're going to tell stories is on timeliness. And so you want to, when you're trying to tell your story, you want to include an element that, um, makes it so that the reporter feels like they have to tell this story now. Um, so Funding rounds are really helpful for this because, um, you know, there tends to be, you, 
depending on if you're doing the firm or if you're working on behalf of a portfolio company, but there's a sort of expectation around how soon you'll announce funding announcements and reporters understand this. And so they want to be the first to share it. So there's motivation, you know, when you go to them and you say, hey, we want to tell this story, you know, in two weeks that they'll, they'll cooperate with that. Um, another example of newsworthiness is this thing that's also, it can also be called trend jacking, but, you know, if there's a sort of broader media conversation going on around a really important um, topic, problem, crisis, and you have a um, unique insight into that issue, um, that's a really good time to come to reporters and say, you know, hey, like, you know, we see you guys have been reporting on, you know, this example is like unemployment. We um, are a job training platform and we have this really relevant data. We'd love to talk to you about it. So just always be, you know, when you want to tell a story, just be thinking, why is it relevant now? Like, why do I have to tell this story now instead of a month from now? The next one is your story must be novel. This is where you have to really step outside of your own sort of uh, biases and uh, experience because, of course, everything that we're building we think is the most exciting, interesting thing. But you really have to zoom out and understand that reporters are speaking to a really broad audience and they have to bring something new and fresh to, to their readers. And so um, when, you know, even if your company or your firm isn't new, you want to make sure that the story you're pitching has this sort of novel component. And, um, you know, that could be a new product, that could be um, a new company, that could be like, um, you know, a new partner who's establishing um, a really innovative, specific vertical at your studio. Um, and, you know, just th this is also an area where we have to have thick skin because reporters can be, uh, you know, not not always the nicest people and, and they're very discerning and can be very critical. And that's just part of their job. It's nothing for us to hold against them, um, but it really means you have to bring it when you talk to them. Okay, then, you know, this is having notable elements in your story is um, kind of like a, a superpower. These are really great secret ingredients and you're not always going to have them. Um, but when you do, it's really helpful. And so, you know, if you are working with a founder who, you know, maybe they're a big name themselves, or they come from a big name company, or they sold their last company to, um, you know, into some big tech um, organization, that's really helpful. Um, on the other hand, if you don't have any of those sort of like big headline names, um, you can also be notable because of the space you're in and sort of the level of specificity. In general, the more niche, specific, unique you can make your messaging, the better. Like in when you're talking to reporters, you want to you want to help them feel like they're discovering something. You know, you don't want to just be part of a big swath of other peers. And the last one is that your story must be actionable. And this ties into sort of the timeliness aspect. It's really important that the readers of the piece or viewers or whatever it may be, um, have a next step to take. And this is going to be different depending on the audience um, of the, of the publication. So for example, um, if you're talking to a tech crunch and, um, you know, the key audience 
one of the key audiences is investors. You can tell a story there that, you know, of a product or a firm update where it's still in the earlier stages. Um, there doesn't necessarily have to be a product that people can go use tomorrow because if you're speaking to investors, they just want to know about what's going on. They want to know about it early. Um, you know, there's sort of an implied um, call to action in that if, you know, investors are reading and they're interested, they can reach out to you. Um, another major audience for TechCrunch is uh, technical talent. And so if you're able to share like, hey, our company, our studio is hiring, that's really, um, that's really helpful as well. Um, but, you know, if you were trying to pitch, um, you know, a USA Today or some really consumer focused publication, maybe about a um, one of your Portco's uh, new products, you would want to make sure that like anyone reading about it that day could go and sign up and start using the product. Um, we had a rule at Facebook where we didn't um, publicly talk about a product until at least 50% of our user base would be able to use it. Um, and that's obviously, you know, at Facebook scale, it's very different. Um, and there's also sort of the, the understanding in tech that things are going to roll out over time. But um, it's just a good rule of thumb to make sure Am I giving am I giving people anywhere to go from here? So the next part I want to talk about is how to actually pitch. Because Alex, I think yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we're actually over the timing for the presentation and the questions. I'm happy to also send this around so that you know people can can read the whole thing. I think a good a good place to sort of sum this up, the idea of really mining um, your firm, your company for what is um, sort of most interesting and positioning yourself as experts on that. That's a way that you can have relationships with reporters even outside of news moments is uh, you can just reach out and say, hey, like I am working in this space. I see that you're writing about it. You know, I would love to meet. Um, alternatively, if you ever have uh, questions about X, Y, Z, like I'm happy to be a source. I think that's something important. That's something that, you know, anyone can do at any point in your trajectory is just start reaching out to reporters and establishing relationships because you don't want your first contact with a reporter to be when you have an announcement. Um, you want to have some rapport already established. So, that's, I think that's um, probably the most useful lesson to leave you with. That's amazing. That's actually what I, we definitely want this uh, deck because the, the how to pitch, that was going to be my question. It's like, how do you actually reach out to these people? But this was super tactical. I love the kind of uh, breakdown of like newsworthy, noteworthy, make sure it's timely. It's such a, it's like a masterclass in marketing and PR. So thank you incredibly. Uh, that was fabulous. And um We'll, we'll find the, the way to send out these materials. A lot of people are asking in the chat. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, thank, you. thank you, Diana, for your moderating. So now is the time for our uh, signature hacks collection session. So we believe that embracing our failures is just as crucial as celebrating our success. And it really helps in growth, like uh, when we go through challenges. So today's hacks collection session is dedicated to collecting failures. So please, uh, now uh, Masha sent the link in the chat and you can follow the link. Please follow and fill out the form and answer the question, what was your biggest venture studio or your uh, startup failure and what did it teach you? Uh, so let's uh, begin. We have three minutes for this activity. I will have a little timer in the background with the music. Please put your answers and then send uh, the form. Now the time is up, so please uh, send the form 
and you will actually get a copy to your uh, back to your email. So thank you for your inputs. Uh, I think that sharing our uh, biggest fails and what we've learned is a great way of collabor collaborative learning. And I think that books that we're mentioning today should also help us achieve our biggest wins and avoid those failures. So also thank you everyone for your inputs in the chat about the books. We have so many answers. I'm so excited to go through them later and really fill my online cart with the new purchases. So let, now let's move on. And I want to introduce you to our next speaker. Uh, we have a new member in the team, uh, Maxim Mali. Uh, he is a research scientist, PhD, uh, who previously did uh, scientific studies on startups and venture capital. So uh, now he's working on the scientific study on venture studios, and he will tell you more about it. Maxim, please uh, join. The stage is yours. Hi everyone, my name is Maxim and I recently joined Venture Studio family with the task to perform, to execute uh, the new Big Venture Studio Research 2024. The main uh, motivation for, for this task and our ultimate go goals are the first one. We want to significantly enhance knowledge on studios to make it better, more accurate, more reliable, more attractive to investors, to everyone on the market. So we uh, conceive this research as an industry standard. So we want to, to make it uh, possible for everyone uh, on the market to, to, to provide its value to studios, to, uh, to founders, to investors and everyone. And in particular for studios, this research may be important, maybe may help in the following ways. So first, it, uh, it should help to convince investors to supply uh, your studio. And then you also can use it to persuade your founders to, to join your startups. And also we want it to uh, help in terms of performing better and data, better data-driven decisions. So, but why we have decided to do that? So, which were the reasons? So, the main reason is that we have checked uh, most popular sources on uh, Venture Studios, most, most popular sources of knowledge, and we found uh, six weak points in this knowledge, which from our perspective significantly decreased the level of trust in the Venture Studio model. So, in particular, first one, First one is that taking industrial benchmark as a, in a report and uh, comparing to these benchmarks uh, the results of, uh, of studios. Uh, for instance, consider time to various, market, to various funding rounds and exit events. This variable can vary significantly from, from fund to fund, from accelerator or various startups. Uh, it depends on industry, on timing, on business model and many other things which are ignored in the studies. Second one is called, I call it metrics without methods. So reports providing some metrics and we do not, we do not know what lies behind these metrics. For instance, um, this citation was taken from one blog post and cited in one report <clears throat> that Idea Lab has 100 plus companies in 20 years and more than 70% still active. But question yourself, what does it mean still active? From our perspective, this only means that less than 30% are dead and nothing else. Uh, possible survivorship bias. Yes, that's a big problem. Uh, we haven't found the exact evidence on this problem in, in the reports, um, but still mm, finding no evidence uh, doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So, for instance, we cannot be sure that the rappers uh, haven't, haven't taken only survive students or only survive studio startups or something like this. Another, another match, uh, sorry, sorry, guys. Uh, another, uh, another one, another issue is absence of preferences. So, uh, for instance, what this interesting, interesting statement that there is 1.5 times uh, difference between valuation of studio startups and traditional startups, we cannot find the exact, exact reference uh, to this information. Uh, next one is methodological inaccuracy. So this is, I believe, uh, an intentional thing, but happens always, not always, but often in reports. So for instance, uh, the average startup is roughly three years old 
And this uh, part is taken from another report. And uh, the problem here is that in the initial one, it is medium. And medium can be significantly different to average. So we should, we should be accurate with these thing, the things. Another one is vanity metrics. Uh, vanity metrics are those ones which do not really show uh, performance, but show vanity. Mm, let's let's see that higher fundraising event speeds in many records equals success. And from our perspective, it is not because fundraising speeds can vary also differently. Uh, it can vary significantly, uh, and it may mean that startup is running out of cash because of some problems inside. Or I don't know. There is one uh, great uh, competitor is rising and. It, need some more cash we do not know without the context so that was my perception of all the reports while i was reading them and you know that there is a fourth quadrant uh, with uh oh that's why and yes i got this uh, understanding later when talked with people from industry and uh, thought a bit so the first reason is uh, uh is that there is lack of lack of scientific approach in the studies and uh, um this is clear, like we are not scientists in the majority of us are not scientists and it's okay to do not scientific research, uh, but still many, many issues I mentioned could be solved by using scientific approach. Uh, another one is impossibility to get studios data. This is a great problem. Um, studios do not want to share their internal data regarding their financial uh, things, financial reports, their overheads or something like that. They simply do not share, and we cannot derive the exact statistics on their performance to compare with um, other uh, other organizations like accelerators, incubators, or so on. Um, so in our upcoming research, we want to solve these issues. Of course, we cannot uh, we cannot promise one hundred percent result, but still we we can promise to do our best. And for the for the second problem, we. Uh, desperately need your help to collect the data, to collect um, good financial data from studios and from startups and so on. Um, so here are a few names of, of professionals which already demonstrated support to our project, you know, Jake, Diana, Matt, Mitchell, Sarah, and so on. And more than 60 already claimed that they uh, want to somehow contribute or sponsor our study. So uh, if you feel yourself that you want to sponsor it or you want to share some knowledge, methodology, data, anything, just scan this QR code. It will, it will direct you to our form and it, it will take one minute to, to fill and submit. And please do it as soon as possible because we are gathering a team together now to start the research soon. So thanks for your attention. I uh, want to start by saying that we're building an amazing community and I want to express huge thank you to all the speakers and participants. Uh, your engagement and openness and willingness to share is really what makes these events so special. And the main goal of our team is to make the venture studios around the world know each other, collaborate and really learn and grow together. And we do this in several ways. First of all is podcasts that Max uh, um, does with uh, studio founders. You can find also the link in the chat to our YouTube channel and see all those amazing interviews with amazing founders and find a lot of insights. We also organize online conferences. So today is our third big online conference and each time we do our best to find best experts in the field to share what they've learned along the way. We also have a WhatsApp chat for Venture Studios, which currently has over 1,300 participants. These are either studio founders or people connected or interested in the in industry. So you can use this chat for your networking. And we also run the Venture Studio family. So if you like the value of our conferences, I offer you to consider getting even more value from the community, which is learning live from your colleagues. And you can do that in the Venture Studio family. 
So the family is a closed paid community for Venture Studios, where studios around the world meet online, discuss their current uh, challenges and questions, share best practices and learn together. Uh, whether you're an established studio or you're just starting your journey, uh, we know that along the way there will be small or big challenges and we believe that the best way to tackle them is through collaborative learning. We also believe that there is no such thing as competition in our industry. Uh, instead, we're all about openness and sharing, and that includes everything from numbers to our hard-earned insights. And we do that, we do that because uh, we think that success for one is success for all. Imagine every studio sharing their secret sauce, and I think the result is really progress and knowledge that benefits everyone. So let me tell you about what's inside the Venture Studio family. The first thing is P2P Zoom calls. Two times a month we have uh, calls, uh, one time uh, for uh, questions and challenges. We also call it a request day where studios come with their questions and just ask, them, ask it to each other and give answers. And the second meeting of a month is for best practices. Every meeting day we have two available times uh, so that studio in any part of the world can connect in convenient time. And the topics for our upcoming best practices days are fundraising into a studio and fund in February. And we're going to talk about studio team in March. And I think that uh, joining these P2P Zoom calls should really save you a lot of time and money because by using proven strategies and avoiding common mistakes, you'll quickly adapt your studio and startups to the market. And uh, uh, um, to the market and this approach can help you uh, find best founders really uh, uh, do fundraising and uh, you can do everything really quickly and efficiently because you already know how others done it before so what else do we have in the, in the Venture Studio community uh, the second thing is sharing uh, exchanging documents so uh, once a quarter, we uh, exchange documents, we uh, collect the requests from our community members, what documents they really want to see from their colleagues, and then we collect those documents by the request and share with each other. We really believe that this is a great way of helping. Then we also have investor days. This is uh, when actually the first investor day is coming up very soon in March this year. We're organizing this day uh, by inviting the investors investors from our network, our community, the investors that already know about the Venture Studio model and are interested in it, as well as uh, studios are bringing their own investors. So we're kind of gathering and collecting investors all together and meeting new investors and uh, <clears throat> making our investor network bigger. And we also organize industry-focused meetings. So if your studio has a specific vertical, we're going to help uh, help you meet other studios in the world in the same vertical so that you can discuss industry-related topics. Uh, so you can do all of that in the Venture Studio family. You can follow the link in the chat or use this one, initiates.com slash family, and find all the details there. We really miss our speakers. I want to introduce you to our next speaker, who is uh, also a, a member of the Venture Studio family community. This is Ben Joskowitz, CPO and founding partner of Highline Beta. Ben is entrepreneur, uh, investor, product expert, and author. Ben actually writes great articles on Substack about startup studios. Highline Beta is a venture studio and a venture capital firm. They've invested in 18 companies and provide corporate venture studio services. And Ben's topic today is the future of venture studios is vertical. So hello, Ben. Hello. Uh, thank you for the intro. Uh, by the way, when you asked for favorite book, I did not want to put up my own book, but uh, in fact, I did write a book in 2013 called Lean Analytics. There's there's the link to it so people can look at that. Think of that as an extension of, of Lean Startup. Um, and thank you for uh, mentioning my uh, sub stack. So the newsletter is called Focus Chaos, not exclusively about studios, but of course, um, you know, having founded one seven years ago, seven and a half years ago, started writing more about that. And uh, I, I reference the, uh, some of that content throughout this, but today I really want to talk about, um, you know, where, where I see the future of venture studios is really focusing on a vertical, 
but I, I made an attempt at defining what I think a vertical looks like and, and certainly happy to answer questions and, and uh, continue the discussion. So a little bit about Highline Beta. So we are a, um, uh, a venture studio and corporate innovation business. As mentioned, we've done 18 um, in investments in companies. These are some examples of companies that we've built and invested in. We also run a corporate innovation business. So we're working with uh, big companies, global companies quite often that are looking to build uh, startups either that they're gonna uh, keep in house or startups that ultimately they would wanna spin out. Um, and over time, uh, Highline Beta is not a vertical studio. So I think it's important to just uh, mention that, that in fact, we didn't start as a vertical studio, but themes and verticals have emerged as we've been doing more work. Uh, so, for example, we've done quite a bit of work in financial services. These are some examples. We've done quite a bit of work in the insurance space as well. Some of that is out of our own interest, uh, and some of that is dictated, in fact, by the corporate partners that we're working with, guiding us into, into specific spaces. Um, and over the last seven years, we've experimented and learned a lot. And, and you, um, you know, this whole community to share more content, which is why Highline Beta participates in, in the Venture Studio family, also start writing on Focus Chaos. Uh, but we've, we've I won't say we've tried it all, but we've tried a lot of stuff, you know, experimented with equity cap table structures, org structures, uh, founder recruitment, brand building, fundraising, business models for Venture Studio. So we've been experimenting and iterating throughout and, and learned a lot through that exercise. And one of the areas that I think is now emerging for us as a venture studio is the notion of, of going vertical. Um, and so, and I, I've written about this as well, but, you know, building a successful venture studio is very, very hard. Building one startup is very hard. Building a system to build multiple startups is, I'm going to argue, even, even harder to do. Uh, and, and part of the reason for that is venture studios have a lot of moving parts and many variables. You have to, I think of it sometimes as, you know, a, a, a recipe, and a studio's job is to bring together all or many of the ingredients that are needed to speed up the process of building good companies. Uh, but that means there are a lot of ingredients that you have to provide. Uh, and so figuring out how to do that horizontally is, is challenging, whereas doing it in a vertical uh, may make that easier. Uh, and although, you know, um, you know, just before we're saying, hey, studios are not necessarily competitive, and I think that that's not an unreasonable way of looking at it, your job is still to build great companies that are ultimately going to have, let's say, exits, which is going to return capital to you and maybe to your investors. So you do need some form of competitive advantage in the market uh, to build a successful studio. So here's how I've been thinking about verticals and how to define them. Uh, it's a Venn diagram, but it's got more than three things in it, which is not terribly surprising. Uh, so for example, B2B is not a vertical. Neither is AI, neither is something like sustainability. And I'm just picking these three as examples because um, these are big, thing, big areas, uh, a lot of attention focusing on AI, a lot of attention being focused on sustainability. Uh, a lot of studios will say, oh, we do B2B, and that's great. I have no issue with that whatsoever, but it's not really a vertical because at the end of the day, a vertical is designed, like a true narrow vertical is actually designed to make the process of building startups easier and easier and easier over time, as opposed to saying, well, B2B, but that could be a, a, a whole variety of different industries, a whole variety of different go-to-market strategies, a whole variety of different business models, a whole variety of different customer types, which means the leverage that you get having gone through the exercise of building a company and then a second and a third and a fourth is minimal. I'm not going to suggest it's, it, there's no leverage, but less than if you focus on a very specific vertical. So the three things for, for me that I think help define a vertical more clearly are the industry or the space. So that's a fairly big bucket, but narrowing from that into customer type. So am I selling to enterprise customers? Am I selling to prosumers? Am I selling to small businesses? And then I think you even would have to define what a small business is because not all of us will even agree on that definition. And then the business model and the go-to-market. Uh, because business model, again, there can be a whole variety of different business models. But if you only do, for example, uh, usage-based pricing, 
on a freemium go-to-market strategy and you become the world's experts at that, uh, then every startup you build gets better and better and, and is able to execute work faster because there are actual playbooks and secret sauce that exist. The other two um, variables that I've included here are technology. So I think AI, for example, can play a role as a horizontal enabler of businesses. And so there might be a tech stack or tech capabilities or tech experience that you have that enables you to build businesses better and faster in a repeatable way. And then geography is also something that you might want to focus on. So are we only building businesses focused on the European market or are we only focusing on businesses in the North American market? Uh, and you might want to have ambition to build global businesses, which is of course completely reasonable and makes sense. Uh, but maybe you're starting in a specific geo. And then geo, you see a lot of studios emerging that are focused on their own specific geo from a founder network perspective and everything else, which I think also can play a role in, in helping define a vertical. So these are just some examples that I came up with. Um, you know, uh, femtech focus on consumers with a subscription business model. So all we do is, is fem, femtech targeting consumers directly with subscriptions. Uh, that might be, you might feel like that's too narrow, but the argument I would make is do you believe there are, call it four to five or four or five to 10 businesses a year over the next three years that you could build in that specific vertical where some of them could become outlier winners and some of them might be smaller winners and some of them will fail. Financial services, again, financial services. So back to, you know, Highline Beta's areas of focus as we move towards verticals, not really a vertical because financial services can mean a whole variety of different things. But financial services, selling to banks, only enterprise software as a service in Europe, that's a, a, a vertical. Or sustainability, not a vertical. Water stewardship, selling to or working with Fortune 100 consumer packaged goods companies doing deep tech is a vertical. So in my mind, I think the more specific you can get about this, the better chance you have of actually building a studio that repeatably and scalably uh, builds great companies. Um, so the components of a venture studio get easier to build. So all those ingredients uh, and use when you specialize on something. So you think about how do we do problem validation? Well, if you're chasing you know, insurance, that could be an enormous number of things that you have to do, interview consumers, interview brokers, interview agents, interview big carriers, small carriers, insurance in Asia, insurance in Africa, it goes on and on and on. You verticalize, problem validation gets easier. The studio team becomes experts in something. Um, your customers and your design partners that you have, you know exactly who they are. Your go-to-market playbooks standardized, your business model standardized. So all of this, even founder recruitment, if you have a very vertical studio and you've demonstrated your capabilities in that space, and I'm a founder looking to build a business in that space, all of a sudden it becomes a no-brainer for me to want to join your studio and work with you because you are in fact the experts at building startups in that vertical. And then I would add co-investors to that as well. So investors that are more focused or narrowly focused or interested in what you're doing, as opposed to investing in a studio more broadly. Uh, and TA McCann sort of talked a little bit about that and started to get into that universe of who are the right kinds of co-investors, investors for your studio, but also investors in the startups that you create. I think it gets easier to identify them and sell them on, on your vision uh, when you focus on a vertical. So you, you ultimately, to win, you have to be known for something. Now, saying you're the world's best at X maybe is a little bit far-fetched. I don't know that that necessarily has to be the case. But if you go to market and say, we build startups, we have a methodology for doing it, we, we can do it fast, we can do it inexpensively, you will find hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, if not over the next few years, thousands of people basically saying the same thing. And while you can all create companies and those things may not be competitive. There is competition for capital. There's competition for founders. There's competition for attention. There's competition for a whole host of things that make it 
difficult for a venture studio to win if it's not focused on something and known for something. Again, maybe not the world's best at, but you better be known for something and establish credibility in something, which in my view is focusing on a narrow vertical. All right. So thank you very much. Again, please subscribe to Focus Chaos, follow me, email me, whatever the case is. And uh, I hope you found this helpful. Thank you, Ben. This was amazing. We have several questions in the chat. So let's start with the, the one from Yan Yan. Uh, when do you know if a vertical becomes too narrow? Yeah, and I, I've lost my Zoom, so I can't stop sharing my screen. But hopefully people can see me anyway. I'll figure it out after. Uh, or you can, you can force the stop sharing. Okay, perfect. Um, so it's a great question. I've thought about this. I'm not sure I have the perfect answer for you, except to say, if you believe that you can build, call it three to five companies a year in a specific vertical over the course of, let's say, three years, and I think about that like a portfolio. So can I build 10 to 15 companies over the course of three years in a space? Uh, do I think that there are enough problems, enough opportunities to do that? If yes, I don't think it's too narrow. If no, it might actually be too narrow. But um, you know, somebody else asked me uh, recently, like, well, what verticals would be good? And I'm like, I don't think there are any bad verticals because I think there are enough problems in the world to go solve and enough opportunities to go solve that if you have the right ingredients to do it, there are probably three to five companies a year that can emerge from that almost in any size vertical. Great. Thank you. And there's one more question that became really popular here in the chat from Diana. How important is it for the vertical niche to tie to the experience of the studio founder? And does the vertical have to tie to their background and experience? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So I think um, the simple answer is yes. Uh, the more complicated answer is not necessarily as long as the founders of the studio have dedicated basically themselves and the rest of their lives to becoming experts in that field. The downside of not knowing what you're doing in a vertical is you have no leverage. There is no, like me starting a vertical studio in water stewardship makes no sense. While I care about that problem and would like to see it solved, I am not the best person on the planet to go solve that problem. Now, if I went and spent the rest of my life dedicated to that problem, then yes, I could become sufficiently able to you know, talk about it, build a network in it, have a reputation in it, attract the investors, attract the founders, and, and, and everything else. Uh, I think there are some things about venture studios that are fairly standard. Validation methodologies tend to be, you know, some folks are better than others. There are some things that you don't require domain expertise, but generally speaking, I think you, you will not get the leverage you need if you are not an expert in it or you're not committed to becoming one very quickly. Great, Ben, thank you so much. Um, so now we're moving on. There can't be a Venture Studio online conference without Max Pog's special skills. So we have a little minute of Max's time and we welcome him back here on the stage. Hello. Thank you, Anya. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so yesterday I saw the agenda or program uh, for for today's uh, conference, and I saw uh, at the middle of the conference slot for me for two minutes, and it was called like interactive sport activity by Max without <laughs> without any details. So I thought uh, what it might be. So I have two options for you, and you have to put in the chat the number one or two. So the first option is boxing, and the second is Cartwheel. So please let me know in the chat what you want to see, and we'll have a short, uh, short yeah, boxing or cartwheel. Cartwheel. Once again. Oh, <laughs> yeah, super. But I saw also box, so uh, I will show to those who wanted to see some box. So this is uh, this is um, punching bag of my four years old son. Uh, okay, so interactive activity for two minutes is finished. I can continue. 
And uh, yeah, thank you for participation. And I want to invite uh, our next moderator, Jake Horitz. And I owe to him very much because uh, more than one year ago, I met uh, papers of GSSN and Jake actually co-founded uh, GSSN, which was, was later acquired by Morrow. Uh, and uh, there are several very popular papers uh, and uh, Jake uh, has written one of them called The Rise of Startup Studios. Uh, Jake now creates podcasts for uh, startup studios recording with uh, studio founders. Uh, the publication is called The Gallery, and it is done much more professional than my podcast, so I, I like them very much, Jake. Uh, and also, he is a co-founder of uh, the um, agency Studio Hybrid called uh, The Thursday, Thursday Labs. Uh, they create uh, content strategy and content for founders, VCs, and studios. Yeah, please, Jake. And also, Jake is um, Jake also does jiu-jitsu training. So <laughs> thank yeah, you, Max. Uh, really great to be here. It's been an awesome presentation conference so far. So thank you all. Um, it's funny because we started doing these in the studio community like seven years ago. I want to say 2017. Yeah, seven years ago. And at first it was nine people and then it was like 11 people and then it eventually got to like 60 people. And that was kind of where it capped off for a long time. And it's um, it's pretty wild and incredible to see hundreds of people now showing up to these calls, even though, you know, the the, the groups have changed, the, the companies running them have changed, the people involved have changed. It's incredible to see that there are thousands of people in a group chat. And so I'm most excited to see where this is going to be in another couple of years a lot of that has to do with who's in the room right now. So I'm going to introduce three different speakers today, Amanda Poole, Mark McNally, and Dominic Pat. I, I think it's pronounced Passler. If I get that wrong, I'm sorry. We haven't met yet, Dominic. But um, anyway, I, I started GSSN, Global Startup Studio Network, in 2018 with a handful of people. It was early studio days. We basically just got people in a Slack room and over Zoom calls to talk to each other about how they're building their studio, and then collected a whole bunch of initial learnings and data on the space and turned it into the first white paper, The Rise of Startup Studios, and published that in uh, towards the beginning of 2019. And then since then, I've been in and around the studio world working with, I think it was like over 120 studios now. Um, but I've always been a marketing guy and a content guy. And as I'm talking right now, my dog is waking up from his nap and sniffing my leg. So if you hear some noise, that's what that is. So I've always been a marketing and content and storytelling guy. I'm a designer. And so I looked at how can we market and build a new asset class called Startup Studios? And I dedicated most of my career so far to that versus just how do I market and build a, a company? And where we're at today is I run this agency slash studio hybrid. It's called Thursday Labs. And we basically build and produce media properties, media companies for founders, for investors, for studios. And this is because founders, I believe, are the new rock stars. They're solving great problems. Everyone idolizes them. Yet most of them are not sharing their story. They are not building a personal brand. They don't have any thought leadership. And without that, it's really hard for them to raise money, hire great talent, and of course, attract customers and make revenue. So one of the shows, we have eight shows right now, uh, and we started this just under a year ago. So it's been a, a busy year. One of those eight shows is The Gallery that I'm the host of. So it's a little bit meta. It's kind of like a studio of studio content. And the gallery is where I put out uh, weekly or bi-weekly podcasts, newsletter, articles, uh, all of which are very, very deep dive technical content about the studio landscape. Uh, we just wrapped up season one. We're about to start launching season two. Some, some recent names of people that we interviewed are Mike Jones. He's the CEO of Science. Uh, Amanda Poole, who used to be at High Alpha, now she's at DVX Ventures, which is a perfect segue into the fact that Amanda is about to come up here. So uh, I'll give her intro, a, a brief intro, but I don't, like, I don't like giving other people's introductions and bios too much because I feel like it's, I can never give it justice. Um, but I'll share a little bit of what I have on Amanda here. So she she's the talent and network leader. Like if you're thinking, how do I attract great entrepreneurs, great founders to my studio or to the studio I want to build soon? Like this is who you want to learn from. Uh, we did an episode a couple months ago now, if that's right, Amanda. So first of all, good to see you again. It was a great episode. Can't wait to see the follow-up here. 
But she spent quite a few years. There's my dog. He's creeping in. Uh, <laughs> spent quite a few years at High Alpha, uh, attracting the founders, building out the talent function there, and then more recently moved over to DVX. So you've launched over 50 portfolio companies now and recruited like twice as many founders, which is pretty substantial. Um, so I'll, I'll pause at this moment, hand it over to Amanda, and uh, really excited to hear what you have to say. And then I'll see you all in a little bit. Yeah. Thanks, Jake. Uh, that's hard to follow your cute dog behind you, but i um, happy to be here. Last time I spoke with Jake for the gallery podcast, I was three days away from giving birth. So I'm feeling a little bit more comfortable <laughs> these days. <laughs> But um, thanks so much for having me. I um, am thrilled to be here. I uh, have worked in venture studio talent for the past seven years of my life. As Jake had mentioned, uh, I recently joined the DVX team. Um, before that, I worked with the High Alpha team, uh, where I joined back in 2017 to really define what our founder recruitment process was. Uh, prior to that, our uh, partners had been the ones who were leading uh, founder recruiting um, and then supporting those founders once we got them up and running. So between my time with the High Alpha and the High Alpha Innovation team, I, I had the opportunity to launch uh, over 50 companies, recruit, recruit close to 100 founders. Um, last fall, I actually joined the DVX Venture Studio team. Um, so I'll expand on the differences in business models between the two studios, um, but essentially doing the same thing, looking for elite talent to co-found and build our ventures alongside, and then supporting those founders in building out their early teams, um, helping them define what their organization is going to look like based on their runway uh, with equity and compensation matters. So um, I have the privilege to not only find the great founders, but then work with them once we have them up and running. Um, so DVX, uh, DVX were a little bit newer on the scene compared to High Alpha. I'll just give you guys a brief overview. Um, well, will I? Um, give me a second here. But the, um, uh, the reason I'll talk through this is uh, because I think we all have different models here. So... Um, DVX were a lower volume, higher touch venture studio. So High Alpha, many of you may be familiar, one of the biggest names in the venture studio space. I had mentioned we launched over 50 companies in my time of uh, six years of tenure. And so um, we, what we would do is we would ID a new concept. We would then recruit a founder then to go launch that concept. In a couple of instances, we back, we worked with founders who had ideas. But the, the deal with High Alpha is essentially to say we, um, uh, we started at the very, very earliest stage. With DVX, what we do is we... Uh, I'm just going to stop sharing because I don't think this is working. With DVX, what we do is we um, we ID a smaller amount of businesses, and then we operate internally, where our partners act as the CEO of the companies until we reach product market fit. Um, so if you think about two different takes on the venture studio model, high alpha is higher volume, lower touch. Um, they're going to invest a smaller amount of money. DVX, we're investing a significant, uh, we're writing checks usually at about 5 million bucks before another investor comes in, and we're actually operating before we bring in a CEO. So I'll be able to talk through those two different models. Um, for, for everyone here, know that my bias is going to be towards B2B SaaS companies. And so when I'm talking through product, you may apply that differently. So product, you some of you may be starting um, consumer goods companies, um, wildly different business models. Uh, so all that to say is my orientation is going to be in software building. So the first... Uh, the thing that I tell most studios who are um, who are getting launched, the, the thing that I see them do uh, that I give the most advice around is having the partners lead their talent recruiting, um, their founder recruiting. And so what happens is, is that the partners are stretched thin, they're fundraising, they're ideating, um, and they're oftentimes pulling from their network. And... Um, instead of having a dedicated talent resource. So my number one uh, guide for everybody who's joined us today is invest in your talent team. Um, don't try to do it yourself. Um, the reason for this is uh, oftentimes because you guys understand how big of a, a ingredient in the recipe of building venture-backed studio companies is. Um, but uh, there's a couple of uh, benefits to not having to do it yourself. And you can do this with an in-house resource like myself. I've been a full-time permanent member of the team, both at High Alpha and DVX. 
Um, for those of you who might need a fractional resource, I'd be so happy to connect you with people in my network who could be great fractional studio town leaders. Uh, you may even outsource this to an executive recruiting firm. But the reasons that you're going to do this is because you need somebody who is going to cultivate and lead a, a holistic network for the firm. Um, so you and your partners, the executives within your studio, you're all going to have incredible networks. That's how you founded a studio. Um, that takes a lot of intention for you guys to do that. And then the firm doesn't actually own those relationships. So a talent leader is going to take a holistic um, view of the network. And they're also going to nurture that network, um, not make you have to remember who you met at that conference a few months ago. They're going to systematize that. Um, additionally, you're going to, they're, you, they're, your talent team is going to hunt for the best talent. So we've talked to a couple of amazing studios. I've worked, I've met with, um, the PSL talent team. I know, um, that there's some really, really big talent teams, uh, at Juxt juxtapose has built an incredible team. Um, but these are going to be hunters. So there are too many people, uh, on this planet who are highly, highly qualified to do exactly what it is that you're trying to do for you to leverage only those people in your network. Um, again, I'm, this is assuming that, you know, incredible, um, individuals. But uh, we're going to talk through some of the criteria where we can um, map the market, know the players, and specifically pick out those players um, of who is going to be the best to lead our, our companies. Uh, the other thing about uh, recruiting elite talent is that this is a bi-directional interview. And so your head of talent is going to create a white glove experience and be an educator. My very first call when I work with um, our executive talent is we go over what the studio model is, the variances in the studio model, like we had just talked about, uh, as well as our, our particular take on it. Uh, we that we don't even get into evaluating the candidate until a couple of calls in because this is a bi-directional interview. They are going to want to know just as much about you as you're going to want to know about them. Um, so this is very much a sales motion. Uh, and then lastly, your head of talent is going to be able to serve as an intermediary between you and the candidate. And so that allows for the partners or those who are going to be working most closely with the candidate to maintain a, a collegial relationship during the negotiation process. So your head of talent is going to get them nailed down on the terms of their contract, their equity, their um, salary, all of that good stuff. Um, so pivoting, we're going to uh, talk about how what CEO or what founder might mean for all of us. So there's many takes in the studio model here. Um, first, some of us are going to be looking for entrepreneurs and residents. So those of you in a studio who are looking to co-ideate businesses uh, or uh, collaborate before day one are going to be looking for some type of builder in residence, founder in residence. There's a bunch of different names for this, but you're looking for somebody who's got market expertise, who's got the DNA of a founder to come and work with you um, on the idea before day zero. Um, some of us, and this will be my the experience I'll pull from High Alpha, are going to be looking for founding CEOs. So those uh, CEOs who we can hand an idea and a check to and who will take it from zero to one from day one. And then um, the last uh, segment of us where I'm now at DVX, we're going to be looking for scaling CEOs. So we're bringing them at Series A. We've already found product market fit. We're now looking to pour gasoline on the fire, and that's going to be a different profile. Um, so let's talk. I wish you guys could see my slides, but um, let's talk a little bit about the... Um, the criteria that you should be assessing your founders against. And so first, you're going to be looking for that foundational leadership um, experience. Somebody earlier today talked about, we're not working with 25-year-old first-time founders. We are looking for, in any of these cases, whether it's an entrepreneur in residence, a founding CEO, or a scaling CEO, we're going to be looking for somebody who's got the financial acumen to manage a PL, who's going to be able to manage their board. So from day one, um, they're, they're going to be responsible for that. Somebody who is investable, who can go out and, and effectively fundraise. Um, in addition to foundational leadership, you're looking for company-specific uh, experiences. So first is going to be business model uh, expertise. So some of us are building marketplaces. Some of us are building... Um, uh, product-led growth companies. So think about how the product is commercialized, and that's going to be the the um, number one criteria that I'm going to index on. 
there's a great quote. Um, I think uh, Nikita is the one who who recently tweeted it. Your product can be gold bars, but if you have no distribution method, then uh, you, your product is worth nothing. And so my um, my personal take is that your CEO uh, should be not only the business leader, but also the commercial leader. We need to get um, founder-led uh, sales figured out before we can then hire somebody else to do it, which is a bit of a hot take. Uh, for many years, lots of uh, Silicon Valley opinions were that product manager made the best CEOs. And um, uh, it, unless it's a product-led growth company, I disagree with that. I think that they really need to be um, seasoned in the commercial motion. Um, so you've got uh, business model fit. You're going to have subject matter expertise. So subject matter expertise, uh, this, as Ben had just said at the end of his talk, is going to, to vary. Uh, so if I'm building a really complicated health tech company, that's it's really important. Um, during my time at IALPA, we built an organ transplant matching software. Uh, not anybody off the street can walk in without that subject matter expertise. There's a specific language. There's specific credentials. Um, they're going to be able to credentialize the business and the market. Um, there are other times, let's say maybe HR tech, it's a little bit less important for somebody to know the ins and outs of uh, the HR function. So it really depends on what you're building. Um, but you, uh, again, there's so many people out in the world. Why not index for that subject matter expertise and that network? That's only going to help the company. Um, uh, and then lastly, let's talk about the... Um, the personality traits. So you're going to be looking for really two things. So one is uh, we can call it grit. We can call it resilience. We can call it fortitude, but somebody who is absolutely relentless and you can test for this during your process. Uh, you can also um, see it in their background. So if they haven't demonstrated it in their background, you're going to want to test through your process. Um, and then the other thing, which is a little counterintuitive, is actually coachability. That's the other side of the coin there, where in the venture studio model, you're providing so many resources. If that uh, founder and CEO is not taking advantage of those resources, they're not coachable. Um, they are, they're not going to be a very effective founder. You're probably going to end up having to turn them over. Um, so I'm not sure how much uh, time we had. I know a lot of the time I'm seeing a ton of questions roll in. So maybe we move to questions. Yeah. Good. I have a question for you. So yeah. let's say you're starting a new studio today and you have a very small budget and most of which is dipping into your personal savings that you've saved up from potentially a recent exit of your own company or whatever money you've put away over the life of your career so far. And you only have maybe a few hours a day to dedicate to like growing long-term the brand of your studio because you're focused on fundraising, you're focused on like building your decks and getting you know your first couple startups built. If you could do one thing a day, that's the highest leverage to meet the most possible highest quality founders. What's that one thing you would do? Mm, that's only one. Question. Um, well, my answer would be uh, have somebody dedicated to talent to do that for you, <laughs> but. Um, the, the thing that I would look for is look, there's, there's plenty of, um, venture, uh, newsletters that tell you about exits. So that is a time where you are really going to be able to catch. So keep an eye out for companies that have exited and maybe had a base hit versus a home run, because those are multi-time founders who are going to be looking to work with, and they're going to be looking for their next gig. Love it. Awesome. Amanda, thank you so much. So yeah. At this moment, um, we are a little bit behind in time, so let's start keep moving forward. I'm going to uh, change things up a lot for us here for a quick second. I got really into breath work recently. Breath work, for anyone who doesn't know here, is when you basically like do some meditative like breathing. It's very foo-foo, if you will. Um, but I also moved to Los Angeles recently, and people love that here. So... I was never the type to be into this. Now I am. Whenever I'm feeling a little tired or a little anxious or anything, I'll sit back and do this quick 60-second breath work. So we're going to do that right now. Um, what I'm going to encourage everyone to do is if you want to turn off your camera because you're going to look a little silly for a second, feel free, but turn it back on when you're done. I'll leave mine on. Um, we're going to sit in silence for about 60 seconds, actually exactly 60 seconds. I'm going to have a timer on our end. And we're going to do some some breath work to get us rebalanced, re-energized, re-motivated for the remainder of uh, the call here. So I'm setting the timer. First thing you're going to do is sit back, close your eyes, and take your right hand, and you're going to take your two 
fingers, your index finger and your middle finger, and put it in the center of your forehead, kind of between your eyebrows and like give it a little rub. You can sit back if you want. Make sure both your feet are on the ground to feel the earth below you, a little groundedness. Close your eyes, rub this area for a moment. Now what you're going to do is take your thumb and you're going to cover your right nostril. So your only your left nostril is open and you're going to exhale slowly. Full exhale out your left nostril. And then you're going to take your ring finger and cover your left nostril, open your right, and you're going to switch to the other side. Now you're going to exhale out your right nostril. When you've exhaled out your right nostril, now you're going to inhale on the right side, switch fingers, and exhale on the left. Now inhale on the left, switch fingers, exhale on the right. And you're going to go back and forth at your own pace for the next 60 seconds. And this is to balance out the right and left of your body, energy-wise and physically, and enjoy. All right, we're going to bring it back now. I hope that was helpful for everybody. If you took a moment to uh, to join us, it's hard to tell how many actually did because most of your cameras were off. But uh, if that's something that you enjoyed or you're curious about, I encourage you to do it every morning or five times a day or whatever you want. Uh, I personally do it throughout the whole day. And it always, it's kind of like a a replacement to drinking coffee, a little bit of a healthier one. All right. So Mark McNally, I think it's time to bring you up to the stage. Uh, Mark, we haven't met yet, but I think we need to chat at some point because I've heard about Nobody's Studios all over the place over the years. Uh, you've been in, in in the startup world, it, it appears, for 25 plus years, 14-time founder. That's pretty impressive. Um, and you've got nine companies right now with the goal of building over 100 in the next five years. Love it. Love the audacious goals. Really curious to hear how you got there, where you guys are based, um, how the everything's playing out. Uh, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, awesome. Really appreciate the time. And Jake, likewise, we should need to connect afterwards. Um, and what an awesome audience, man. I just, I hear the, the speakers, Amanda and Benjamin and Mutt and everybody else on the call. It's like, I feel like we should all get together somewhere for a retreat and like hang out for a couple of days. So yeah, I look forward to the connections that, that come from here. Um, yeah, um, real quick on my backstory, as, as Jake said, I've I've been a, a startup kind of serial entrepreneur since uh, the last 27 years. I was fortunate coming out of the service, six years Army Special Ops, to um, stumble into my first opportunity to build a company. And I was determined to build a company, but it could have been a taco shop. But I found two guys in the back of the warehouse who had this idea they could connect buyers and suppliers on this new thing called the internet. And that was in 96. And I joined as employee eight. Scale is 800 employees. I wrote the S1, did the roadshow, took it public on the NASDAQ in 1999. So 25 year old Mark was sitting on a four and a half billion dollar market cap company. It was like, oh, this is exactly what I dreamt of when I was seven. This is how startups work. And so I've been hooked on this whole process ever since. Uh, I spent the 20 years after that proving that that was not always how it goes. Um, and you've got to learn, you know, there's lots of twists and turns of startups. But um, I think that first experience for me just, got me hooked on the idea that when you're part of something, if you got the why right, the people right, the timing right, the execution right, sky's the limit. And so for me, it was always a gift to think that going big is something that's always possible. Um, a pretty diverse startup career after that, 14 startups, as Jake mentioned, um, where I was a majority shareholder, a significant shareholder, usually a C-level or founder of a company. Um, started out in B2B commerce, went into consumer-facing e-commerce, also built one of the largest trading platforms for connecting buyers and suppliers globally. So that got me into the international scene and then uh, pivoted into AI and machine learning for the last 10 years of my career. So pretty diverse. And then another couple dozen companies where I was a small mentor or angel investor. So I feel like I've got this collectively like 30 or 40 companies that I was passionately involved in leading up into my studio epiphany. Um, my studio epiphany started in 96 when I was fortunate enough to have the IPO and for a brief period of my life, money was not an object before it was again. Um, and there's a guy named Bill Gross creating this company called Idea Lab in Pasadena, which is not too far from where I'm at. I'm in Orange County, California. And he had this idea of building companies at scale and in parallel and having the resources and a lot of things we all fantasize in the studio, you know, aficionados. But he was doing it back in 96. And, you know, I was fortunate to be in that kind of center of the universe back then with resources. And 
I actually put a quite a bit of time into thinking about building whatever we called it back then, incubator. Um, and then the you know, market crashed in 2000, 2001, and I had to go back to work for a day job and earn a living. And so I put that back on the shelf, but I've been studying him and watching him ever since. So, you know, now you, most of you guys know Idea Labs had 50 IPOs as 200 viable companies in the market. So to watch that journey from 96, when I was actually viably going to go after that market and then decide to go out and actually build a studio five years ago, um, I'm glad I wasn't able to forget the financial implications. I'm glad I wasn't able to do it back then because my journey since really made me uh, the person that has a legitimate chance of doing what I'm doing now because I've had so many other lessons and scars and mistakes and everything else along the journey that allows me to you know run the studio at the level we are now. So those of you who don't know Nobody Studios, um, we have a big gnarly audacious goal of doing 100 companies in five years. Um, I love DHAGs because they are stretching goals. Um, I think the reason why you say that kind of statement is because it tells you the scale what we're trying to solve the problem at. Um, and I like the hags because if I said we're doing 20 companies in five years, a lot of people would go, wow, that's a lot, but you're going to have to throw more people and more money at it. But you know, I see how it's possible. But the minute you say 100, a whole bunch of people leave the audience. And that's kind of what we want. We want people to say, okay, that's possible, but you're going to have to reinvent how you create companies. You have to reinvent how you fund them. You have to reinvent how you mitigate your risk in terms of the bets you make. You're going to have to reinvent, to Amanda's point, how you recruit people and how you empower them. But even who is the right people? You're going to have to reinvent how much mitigation of the risk is. So to Amanda's point, we were betting a lot more on the studio in the earliest days and then hiring scale founders, but doing uh, doing this in parallel. So uh, we are four years old. Uh, we're going into our fifth year. And um, yeah, we're just like a lot of people on this call, just trying to earn our stripes every day and solve a new problem and, and, you know, create our, create our legacy here, hopefully. So um, appreciate the audience. Um, that's our background. That's who we are. Um, the thing I wanted to talk about, let me see if I can share my screen. I'll go with uh, Amanda's option if it doesn't work. Part of our big goal of doing 100 companies in five years and <clears throat> somewhere in the next five to 10 years, we think that rate probably goes to 100 companies a year, to be quite honest. Um, it really is around faster um, builds. It's about more frugal builds. Um, it means building companies um, by being very focused on the amount of capital you put into it. But the studio bet, again, for our, our model, is we're betting a lot on our core team to get these companies moving really, really fast in the early stage, which means you're doing, for a fraction of the dollars, a lot more. You might put you know, a quarter million dollars or half a million dollars into a company, but it's going to look more like a company you put two or three million dollars into it because of the combined technology stack, because of the combined leadership team. Um, we, this was when I wrote the thesis for the studio, it was during a time four or five years ago where I called the, uh, the um, unicorn party, which was people were going crazy. Everybody thought that everything they were going to touch, everything they were going to create was going to be a unicorn. Um, we actually believe the market's fundamentally going the opposite direction. So that's what I wanted to give to this audience today. This is our contribution to this conversation. Um, we actually believe that we are going into a spot where innovation is about to go into hyperdrive. Uh, building a company that has a 10 or 15 year time horizon is exposing yourself to more disruption that you probably have no chance of possibly anticipating. And so overcapitalizing a company early, put yourself at a risk of you know higher failure rates versus being very focused on success, product market fit, revenue, good team, and optimizing for an earlier stage exit. So we had this slide in our deck for the last four years. Um, unicorns, everybody's betting on one. And we literally had this as our slide. Good luck with that. Because um, we talked about this idea that when you're betting on a unicorn, it's a boom or bust mentality. You're betting, it's like being at Vegas and you're sliding all your chips across it. And you're hoping that works out. Um, my experience in 27 years, is the people that I aspire to be or the people I know who had the most liquid cash or live the dreams that I want to dream, you know, live. There are people who had medium sized exits or low, you know, or even smaller exits, early stage exits, but they were liquid. And when the minute you start saying, I'm going to build something that's a unicorn. Again, I started my career when, you know, my first startup, I built an $8 million data center and I had 27 people in the data room managing a raised floor, you know, data center with Halon, you know, fire extinguishers, like now I'd spend a thousand dollars and spend that up in AWS. So we're moving into a different world in terms of the, what it costs and the amount of energy and effort it takes to build companies. 
And so we actually think that the sweet spot is building faster, more progressive companies versus the high risk, low probability. Um, and then the other thing that I think a lot of people don't understand is if you raise a $10 million on a series A on a $30 million valuation, then that company is worth 40 million. But everyone on that board wants a 10X, right? That's the given math. Everyone wants at least a 10X return. So they're looking for a $400 million return or bigger. They're probably already on a unicorn exit is the only possible scenario. Well, 80% of acquisitions happen under $300 million. So raising too much money too early prices yourself out of the most likely exit. And so my contribution to this conversation is think differently into the market we're going into. Unicorns are not the answer. Be disciplined in your cap tables. Keep them lean and mean, only bring in the capital you actually need. Don't overcapitalize so that you can be open to all the early and stay, mid-stage exits. And for us, again, for volume, that works for us because we, we intend to you know, own the majority of the companies we create. And so looking at a company where we can create something really good rapidly in a year or two, create a great exit for our founders, great exit for our investors, go back and do another company in the same category, usually with the same founders. That's, that's kind of the recipe for, for success. And um, when you look at you know, the overall shift of the paradigm shifts, I've been in this industry since you know, 1996 when I saw the internet transform as like the biggest paradigm shift of our lifetime. But it took almost 30 years to go from changing how we bank and how we date to now it's changing how we elect our leaders, right? But it was a 30-year journey, which largely meant a lot of the people I saw saying this wasn't going to be a thing. You know, I met the president of Gap telling me that the internet was only going to be a place that people got coupons to go into stores. Like I've seen this evolution. But 30 years allowed a lot of people to retire and allowed an entire new generation to come in and embrace the internet age. We're going into a space where the next 10, 20 years will be dominated by dealing with paradigm shifts like robotics and AI and, and crypto and so many different things at the exact same time. And just like you know, ChatGPT has taught us, it can disrupt an industry in six months. And so we're moving to the space where building a company over 10 or 15 years is becoming riskier. And so we're definitely focused on that. And my, my exclamation point here is the idea of unicorns was coined in 2015. Fortune Magazine, the age of the unicorns. And the last article in the last month was the age of the unicorpses. There was seven unicorns eight years ago. There's 1,200 today. 1,100 of them are looking for capital. It will not end good for investors or employees. So I would encourage everybody who's thinking about doing a studio, think lean and mean, be disciplined on your cap tables, and be optimized for the mid-stage exit. Peace out. Thanks. Mark, that was awesome. Can I ask you a quick question that's been on my mind since Please. before today? I've noticed over the years you guys have been around a pretty big emphasis on the, the name, nobody. And mm -hmm. I think it says a lot about your brand ethos. You've even explained a bit today. What's the history of the name, but also what does it mean in your case to be a nobody? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Um, yeah, it means a lot. There's actually a bunch of backstories. Again, if we all get in our retreat someday, you'll hear two or three of the backstories. But um, yeah, you know, I think at the highest level, the easiest thing to say is like, we knew we were building this. We we intended to impact company creation and entrepreneurs and emerging markets in places and sectors and people that we would normally not meet and be a galvanizing force to bring those things to life. And it was so ultimately, it was bigger than any one of us. And I meant that from the very beginning. This was bigger than me. It wasn't going to be McNally Studios. And it was always going to be defined by the types of people we attracted to the journey. And so this idea that you had to check your ego at the door was super like fundamental. Right. And I didn't realize this in my startup career, but in this kind of evolution of the studio, I realized that this, this kind of roots of my character came from my special ops days. You have a lot of badass freaking people that don't talk about it. You know, they're very humble, they're very quiet, and they just do their job and they, they have each other's back. And I just wanted that kind of, you know, ethos throughout our company. And we've been fortunate, not just the people who have been attracted, the best people I've ever worked with have been attracted to the journey. But our angel investors that got us off the ground after I self-funded it. I mean, we got former CEO of Coke and CIO of American Airlines and innovation officer of Volkswagen, like really world-class executives, but they checked their ego at the door and they join a call trying to solve a problem just like anybody else would. And so I just think that that culture has, has unlocked a lot. But there's another thing we do as a studio is when you're part of any one of our companies, you're in equity across our whole portfolio. And so everybody is helping each other. And so if I need to grab my blockchain expert from my FinTech team to help my healthcare company who's trying to secure health records, 
they're glad to do it. The intellectual exercise is a blast, but they're all cross-incentivized. And so again, this idea that there's no one personality, the tree goes to the door, let's build something special bigger than all of us. It's fantastic. We got another a couple of good questions in the chat that uh, I'd love to bring up real quick, which is on the, the crowdfunding topic. I, I think you might be the only studio that's ever pulled off a crowdfund at the studio level. Can you quickly describe when you did it, how you did it, where you guys hosted the actual fund, and then what the, the structure was for that? Yeah. Um, yeah. From the very beginning, again, leaving my garage you know, five years ago, we said we we're going to do crowdfunding. Um, and what it meant to me back then was two things. I've been through so many ups and downs with the VC cycle, and I love VC. VCs are brethren. They're going to you know, help fund our companies, our partners, what we do. But the VC model gets some things wrong, which is there's like, they, a lot of them follow like sheep. You know, there's a certain theme of the year that's really hot, and then it's dead. And that's not how great companies are built. So I always wanted to democratize capital sources. So I always wanted to make sure that if we're building something special, but it's not cool in VC, we had a way to tap into it. So I always wanted to have the power of the crowd as a way of democratizing what actually gets built. Secondly, you know, for us, power of the crowd and crowd, you know, crowd infused is one of our terms. Everything we do from ideation to pricing, to branding, to launch, we involve the crowd. So when we looked at crowdfunding, to be really honest, everyone's called, don't do it for capital, right? It's a very inefficient place for capital. So don't, if you want to talk about that, I'll give you all the scars. I do it walking into it. Crowdfunding is not an efficient place to find capital. You put so much energy and time into it that the cost of capital is, is, is not friendly. Yeah. We knew from the very beginning, we'd build a brand, but more importantly, we'd end up with an audience. And so we ended up with investors in 56 countries, over a thousand investors. And for a lot of people, they'd look at it, my old school thinking 20 years ago, it'd be like, I have three investors, it's way easier. But for us, we were like, that becomes the power of the studio. And they are. They're, they bring our their networks, their ideas, their connections, their scouts for us. They they bring in, you know, concepts from their industry, from their day jobs. And so we did that very purposefully. And the byproduct of that was we have a very large brand in the space. But it was because at the end of the day, let's just say the entire raise was a wash. It was profitable or neutral, and we ended up with a great brand and a great network of people. And that was kind of the way we looked at it. Awesome. Mark. Thank you very much. I'm uh, about an hour from you in Venice, so let's definitely get together one of these days. I'll shoot awesome. you an email. Yeah, I look forward to it. This is great. Well, thank you. So uh, I'm going to share a quick story that I was asked to share today on the topic of, of books. Uh, and then I've got three very brief calls to action that I hope can actually provide value to everybody else here. Uh, and then we'll get into our last speaker. So my my book story is, and it's a failure story too, my first like real rock bottom failure moment related to my my career was I was 22. I had just uh, raised my first round of capital for a startup with a co-founder, just graduated from college. It was my second company at the time. And in the span of one week, not even, it was like five days, one week, my co-founder left the company. He's like, I can't do this. My girlfriend of three years broke up with me, just dumped me out of nowhere. And my best friend who I was living with had a pretty substantial health emergency. So needless to say, I had to like, return the money, not build the startup, take a little bit of time. It was a, a big rock bottom. And the book I I leaned on was The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. It's a pretty popular, famous book, at least in the States. Uh, I'm not sure about elsewhere, but great read. It basically puts into perspective, it's a very kind of clickbaity title, but it really put into perspective for me how to categorize in your life. What are just the core couple of things to actually care about and put all of your energy and focus on, and then everything else just be laid back and don't care about it. Uh, and it's a very challenging thing. So this helped me get going again. And then I got into the studio world like six months after that. And that was the next big chapter of my career. Um, so the book is called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. And I'll put it here in the chat for everybody real quick. Subtle art of not giving a fuck. I typically would say, excuse my language, but I'm quoting the name of the book. So uh, it's not on me. All right. So a couple of quick calls to action. Um, hopefully these all help everybody here. The first one is about the gallery. So the gallery is the content company that uh, we started about startup studios. We are starting to map out season two. And this is for you guys. It's for all of you here. It's not for me. DM me on LinkedIn or send me an email. Uh, topics and speakers that you're curious about and 
people you want to hear from. Uh, we go very deep and technical about our content. So if it's like, hey, how do I, you know, what's like the best marketing for a studio? Like, it would be a lot more deeper than a lot deeper than that. But open to suggestions, want to create content that actually people want. The second call to action is for my broader uh, umbrella studio, which is Thursday Labs. Uh, I'm the content guy. We tell stories for founders and investors. So happy to help anyone on this call. If you're thinking, man, I would love to launch a podcast this year. Like, God, I should have a newsletter and I don't know where to start and that people need to know who I am. Investors, LPs, EIRs, people to build. Um, I'd love to just help. So if I can hop on a 15 or 30 minute call with anybody and just talk about like, what do you have going on? Maybe do a little review of your LinkedIn and the content you might already be putting out or give you some quick tips on like, here's how to go from zero to one uh, for free on how to, how to create content and start getting your name out there more. Uh, that's what I'm all about. So if you want to send me a DM or an email on those, happy to help. The last call to action is any word, some words of encouragement for everybody here. The best thing and this is, but if I could, you could walk away with one thing from today, the best thing you can do for yourselves when building a new studio for the next two to three years, starting today, is just build great startups. Lean on the, the, the success of the companies you've built in the past or the startups you're building now. It's so easy to get disillusioned and excited about all the details of like, what should be my fund structure and like, how should we incentivize LPs and like, two and 20 this or 20% carry there. It's just like, it's very easy to spend all your time on that and ignore the actual building of great companies. And if you have great startups with great markups and great valuations and great returns and great results, great revenue, that will solve all of your problems. It's kind of like in business when they say like sales cures everything. For studio world, like great portfolio companies cures everything. So just, just build, focus on building. And that'll also help everyone else in the room too, because the more exited companies, the more ROI, the more uh, unicorns or even just like $100 million, even $10 million exits that exist in the studio world, the better for everyone. So focus on building, build great startups. All right, I'm a little bit out of breath, but I'm going to introduce our third speaker and then I will bid you adieu to everybody today. I think that's it for me. So thank you all for having me. Uh, my At least the third speaker for me to introduce is Dominic Passler. So Dominic is a general partner at ICO Red One Fund. A um, couple of quick numbers I'm going to bang through here to kind of set the stage for you, Dominic, and then I'll let you take over. But um, you guys have been active for 13 years, from what I understand. You've built over 42 companies, uh, 16 exits. That's substantial. And the portfolio value is over $100 million. You've got over 100 people on board. And you guys focus on fintech and Web3. If I messed any of those up, let me know. But uh, You just uh, took two of my slides, but it's okay. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I would love for you, to, uh, love for you to, to dive in. Well, thank you so much for being here, Dominic. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jake. And yeah, let me share my screen. And let's, yeah, let's jump to it. Oh, do you see my screen? I see yeah. it very weirdly. You see it, yeah? Uh, yeah, we can see it, okay. Okay. Uh, I don't know why I'm not seeing it very well. Do you see my... Pre wait. Do you see my presentation now or not? No, when I... No, okay, we just see your wallpaper. Me, let, me, let me start it again. Do you yeah, see my now, presentation now? Now, now cool. we see it, yes. Okay, let's go with it. So yeah, thanks again uh, for the introduction, Jake. So Dominic Pastor, general partner of Venture, uh, ICO Venture Builder Fund, Red One Fund. Uh, yeah, I will be speaking today about our venture building model. And I also include uh, in the in the second part of the presentation, a few of our fundraising hacks. We've been recently fundraising, so, so we got some fresh ones. But before I start, shout out to the whole Venture Studio family, uh, Max, Marsha, and the team. You are doing some amazing events here. The speakers are great. Uh, even for us being long on the market, it's so helpful to be here. So, uh, okay. So quickly about ICO. So we, yeah, we are 13 years old on the market already. We started as a software house. Uh, so this was our beginning, but then it evolved into a venture builder. And yeah, while evolving, we, we grew to, uh, to a team of 100 people and still counting. I think it's 105 right now uh, in 12 different countries. Uh, we don't have 12 different offices. We are a 100% remote company. Uh, and we find it very helpful. We started this before uh, COVID, so COVID wasn't the reason for going remote, and we just find it very efficient. Uh, yeah, we have a portfolio value of $100, $100 million plus, 42 startups co-created, 
16 exits, of course, some smaller ones in it, but uh, but some of them also very, very good. So when it comes about uh, uh, to our focus, we are focused on three main industries. The first one is uh, fintech, second one is big data, and the third one is Web3. I would say our sweet spot is somewhere between fintech and Web3 and the connection of both of these industries. Uh, yeah, even with the beer market, which was there uh, for uh, for the last years in Web3, we are proud to say we are still in it. We didn't change to AI because of the beer market, uh, because crypto is not all, uh, Web3 blockchain is not all about crypto. Uh, uh, there is much more. There is a big use of the te this technology, especially in the fintech industry. But in, in our big data uh, part, we are also touching AI and we are very specialized in SaaS companies. So yeah, coming to the Meritum, our venture building model. So we, uh, our ventures uh, builder is, um, uh, we work in a dual entity model. Uh, and this was also uh, always uh, very important for us. So we kind of divided the phase one investment, which is everything what happens in the studio, and the phase two investment, which is everything what happens uh, uh, and uh, the fund is responsible for. So basically the fa phase one investment, which is everything what happens in the studio is divided into three stages. So the phase st stage is the ideation phase. Sorry, let me just grab a zip. And the ideation phase. And the ideation phase is, uh, is divided into harvesting and defining. So it's everything about harvesting the idea. So deep scope research, market problem analysis, business brief creation. So it's about finding the ideas and writing them down in a standardized way. Why? Because after the ideation phase, there is a voting. So a voting is basically our investment committee coming from person, both from the validation, so from the studio part and from the fund part to vote which of the ideas should go to the next stage. So, and, and then the next stage is coming to the verification phase. The verification phase is everything about finding the unique uh, selling points, about some deep uh, customer research, finding the beach at market. And of course, it's already a time where you sh should start to look and we are doing that, uh, who should run the startup later on. Again, another voting after that phase, and then we jump into the creation phase. This is definitely the one which is the most cost efficient, uh, most costly. And yeah, this is the time when we want to build an uh, initial MVP. We want to have a confirmation of our product market fit in the perfect scenario, even have uh, some paying clients and definitely have some first recruitment on board. Why? Because that's the time when after a voting is becoming a separate entity. So by the end of the day, this part is, the investment and the responsibility of this process is fully on the studio. And once once this part is over and one it goes through the last voting, it will become a separate entity. And then the capital from our venture capital is going in and also the responsibility for that startup. So it's going into the spin out phase, which is basically uh, super focused on investment of growth and grow of the startup, finding the product market fit and also already start to look for external fundraising. We are open already on this stage for co-investors, uh, but it's depending on each startup yeah and and how long the runway of the startup will be and there is the last stage is k-lab phase uh, so basically the fund also has some tickets for follow-on investments for the startup that will really need it because they produce less uh, or uh, or are just so 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 good and looking at the venture building model now from a different perspective so from the team perspective because this is something that we really worked on for a long time on how to do it the best uh, and actually we started with creating teams for particular ideas from the beginning but we came to the model where we have teams for different stages of the of the validation phase. So most venture studios here. So I'm I'm now covering the the phase which is happening in the studio. Yeah. So from ideation to creation. So before it's coming to the separate entity. And here we start with the harvesting team. We call them scouts, which is basically again as I said before, harvesting for the the idea. Yeah. So searching for idea, doing deep scope research, entry analysis, and stating it in a basic standardized set of information, which is basically covering pro a problem target group market and uh and this most crucial information and then this particular idea will go to the defining team so the defining team will really state everything important about the idea in a standardized way so it can it can go to the voting part after the voting part some of the ideas of course will drop out but the ones that are accepted will go to the verification phase where again there is few separate team for the verification uh for, for the verification stage and these teams of course are chosen depending on the startups uh, startups uh, product and, and and what talent is just needed there so this as, as mentioned before it was very important for us uh, to really try out different models of, of taking this the, the our team in, into different stages of the startup and this is what we found to works best for us when it comes to the part of a, a studio and fund portfolio startup relations so how do we divide 
the investment and the shares between startup, we kind of decided to do it on a constant level. So everything was happening in the validation phase until it's a separate startup. It's happening in the studio. Studio is taking 100% responsibility for financing it. And of course, all the IP rights and all the shares are staying in the studio. Once it's becoming a separate entity, Red Fund, uh, Red Fund One Fund kicks in, puts capital directly into the new, 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 new entity and gets shares for it. And now going even into more details, we kind of looked for a perfect scenario for us, like what will really work for us? What's the default situation where we want to have a startup? And we found that for us, it's between the creation and spin out phase. So once it's becoming a separate entity, we want to reach to have in every startup the clear level of shares. It's understandable for investors then from the fund and from the studio and everyone feels rewarded for their work. So this is the default situation for us and with this split uh, between the group so the studio and the and, and red one fund we feel very comfortable with uh and yeah this is just uh, how we how we decided to do it so yeah i will finish the part about uh, the model right now here uh, if you will have any questions to that you can just straight down uh, write them down in the in the comments and we'll jump on to them some uh, fundraising hacks so first hundred uh, fundraising hack uh, creating a fundraising playbook. So basically what it is, for us a fundraising playbook is having everything prepared in one place, what you will need for your fundraising efforts to the, just before you start. And why doing so? Basically for efficiency. So we basically uh, made a roadmap of what's happening step by step from lead generation to getting an investment on the board and going through, the, through it very quickly. So. In lead generation, we de defined all sources. We defined rules to put our, our investors in CRM in a structured way so we will know who to reach out to in which moment. For initial uh, meetings, we had a whole scenario of it. And I don't mean only the pitch here because the pitch, of course, is the crucial part. And of course, some part, uh, some, some tools like Calendly very help to be just more efficient and have more, more slots booked and not always ask for particular times. When it comes to sending first document back, we divided everything and created a uh, virtual data room to have everything in one place, very easily accessible. And then again, using another tool, DocSend, it just to make it much easier to share. And also this cool feature about DocSend, although it looks a bit old, it's, uh, is, is that once you use it, you can really see uh, how, ma how much time particular persons uh, are spending on each slide. So. Uh, another one with the document pack email templates. It, it's very, uh, it's just making life so much easier. Of course, it's always adjustable for different uh, persons, but it's just much easier and much faster to do so. And then optional document pack. While fundraising with family offices, of course, they will ask you for all the documents. The faster you answer, it's always better. So have everything ready in one place, your due diligence pack, your financials, your portfolio cases. It's just making your life so much easier while fundraising. And then the crucial part in fundraising is relationship building. Yeah, so we all know that without it, it it's hard in our industry when the investors are investing in such a long time period. Otherwise, if it's for the, for your fund or for your studio or in particular port, port codes, it's just all about regular communication, marketing strategy. And we all want to have that uh, signed term sheet. Yeah, so this is very crucial. And uh, even uh, although it's not a legal, legal, uh, legal document, we find very, very good to have it. Why? Because it's taking so much time to close an investor from this part. So yeah, this is this is just, uh, just why we decided to do so. And uh, a last part in, the, in our fundraising playbook is actually a playbook in a playbook because while you have this investor, while he, he signed your uh, uh, your contract, it, it takes a lot of time, especially as a European fund entity, to onboard him. So we have another playbook just to step by step onboard him and really guide him through the onboarding, KYC, ML, and all the parts. It's also just making our life more, more easier and, and efficient. So yeah, that's the first hack. The second uh, hack is a bit easier and more straightforward. So it's once you already have your playbook done, once you know, okay, I'm fundraising right now, I'm start, starting the next day, have a, quite a plan who you're reaching out to in which moment. All of the groups which we are reaching out, no matter if it's business angels or family offices or our network of individuals, they are all a bit different. Uh, but usually before you group them in these groups, you have your FFF, so family, friends, foods, you have your warm intros that you can, that you can try out and you can uh, try out called outreach. So this is all very important to just, uh, uh, to just mention and to group because for each of the group, your pitch will be kind of different. You will, you will think differently. You will answer different questions. So it's good to take them step by step. Of course, they will mix up in the moment after a few months, but, uh, but this is just making your beginning much more efficient. The next one is called outreach. Uh, and that's the, that's the uh, quite last one. Uh, so basically we've been very skeptical to it. 
but we tried it out. It takes some time to get into it and, and really try out cold outreach, but you can reach, you know, 45% open rate, reply rate of 18%. We found it very, very efficient by the end of the day. So here are just two things we can we can share with you. Database building for lead finding, LinkedIn Sales Navigator is just a great tool, but you need to scrap down the leads. So Snow IO is one of the tools to really do so. And for outreach tools, there are so many different solutions, but we found Lemlist together uh, as an outreach tool, very, very efficient. Of course, course you need a HubSpot to have so and again coming back to hack number one create your templates in Facebook scroll from it why because your stop startups will need it later basically every startup is selling something and this is a great way to sell last hack before I before I finish because I'm I think I'm a lack of time is showing venture building as a new asset class and what I mean by that very often we compare venture capital to venture builders and it's, of course, very good. I think you all saw the slides from Max Box uh, uh, startup research. Uh, but it's not always about comparing. I think showing us as, uh, as, as a different asset class is also very beneficial. Why? Because when you go to investors like family offices, like bigger investors, institutional investors, they will not put you in the same bag of their potential investment with venture capitals where there's much more competition, but in a different bag of venture builders. We are much less and, and let's use it out uh, till, till it is like that. And yeah, that's it for today. If you will have any questions, uh, I'm free to open now. If they will come up later, just hit me up on LinkedIn. Thanks, guys. I have a, one quick question for you, Dominic. On, of course. On the last piece you brought up, which is positioning this as a new asset class. Uh, yeah. I struggle with that one. I don't want to push back completely, but okay. when you're raising from family offices or LPs, they still are going to bucket this into the world of VC when it comes to all of their allocations. Some might be in real estate or in the stock yeah. market or whatever it is. So when you when you go up to new investors who are like, well, I've been in VC for 25 years. I know that space. Do you prefer to be like, well, this is a whole new thing and I want to teach you about it? Or do you prefer to just get the meeting, show them that this is similar and get the money wired and then just like do your own thing? This is a good question because actually, you know, it's kind of the same approach, but it a bit depends with with whom you are speaking. Because from one perspective, we all know we are kind of in the same basket in their family office portfolio, like venture capitals, venture builders, all these kinds of companies are in one basket. But I I mean more about the trigger of speaking because a lot of times, oh, sorry, it's my timer, and a lot of times. Uh, they're so they have so many requests of this investment that if they see okay another venture capital or oh, emerging one or they are just starting it it's not so easy. And once you say to them okay we are different, this is kind of different from venture capitals. That can be the trigger to get you on the meeting. So this is what I mean by that to use it as a trigger. And there is a lot of things that are a bit different when it comes to the risk level, when it comes to the portfolio cases, and so on. And the list goes on. Yes. So. I get your point, but I, I think the, the the trigger thing here is is uh, is very beneficial. Totally, Dominic. Thank you very much. Uh, this was great, and uh, I'll Thanks. back I'll back off again. Hand it back over to to Annie. Yes, Thanks, thank you so much, Jake, for uh, hosting and really asking valuable questions to the speakers. It was really good. So I'm taking over for the last part and our last speaker. And I want to quickly mention that uh, our previous speaker, Dominic, uh, in their studio is a member of Venture Studio family, as well as our next and last speaker for today, Damien Rotley, also uh, Founders Factory is the member of uh, founder of uh, Venture Studio family. So let me introduce you to Damien. Uh, Damien is the Chief Operating Officer at Founders Factory. Since 2015, Founders Factory's 300 portfolio companies have raised $800 million follow-on funding, and it invests in diverse funding teams across industries and geographies. So uh, Damien will talk uh, today about learnings through operating a high-volume venture studio. But before, uh, I want, uh, I want uh, to ask the audience a question, so you can put your answer in the chat. How many startups do you think uh, Founders Factory created as a venture studio in 2023? So just put your guesses in the chat and I think Damien will give us the answer. I will certainly try. Well, thanks, Annie. Uh, it's good to see you and, and uh, good to see so many familiar faces uh, on, on the call. Um, so, yeah, so as Annie said, I'm, I'm the CEO at Founders Factory. Um, <clears throat> we have been building last year we launched 15 companies um and i'm going to talk to you about a selection of those in a second but what i thought i'd do is just frame a little bit of who we are and um 
uh, and then go into a little bit of detail around the process that we go through, because as you can understand, when you're operating at quite a high velocity, you need to have some uh, pretty rigorous rails um, that the process runs on. And um, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, how we monitor success, how we track the progress of the venture, how we then sort of think about the concept of the product of the venture studio, um, and um, and some of the learnings that uh, that we've taken over the last um, nine years of operation since uh, since we were founded. So let me hopefully you can all see my screen um but let me flick on a little bit so as i said we we are um we've got about 300 companies in the portfolio we're backed by some of the world's largest um corporations um and those those businesses have, have raised uh, close to a billion in, in follow-on capital um we have a bunch of operators permanently employed in the team across all of the different functions that as an early stage founder you'd really want to hire but often could not afford. Um, and we wrap those individuals around each of the businesses that come through. Um, and, I, and I guess our, our sort of proposition is, you know, as, as won't be a surprise to anyone, capital, operational support, access to corporate partners for sort of um, traject, uh, you know, to help um, really accelerate changes in, in their trajectory, and then access to an incredible network of Probably the, one of the best networks that I think part of, you know, we're sort of linked to Founders Forum. Um, so it's one of the best networks in technology for government ministers and um, corporate CEOs, venture capitalists, and, and of course, um, high profile entrepreneurs. Um, some of the big successes, these are the banner successes, I, I, I think that, that we have um, within the portfolio and including some big raises and, and some very familiar funds that have backed those. We obviously operate um, across a number of different models. Um, but I want to talk about the studio and really our vision here is to try and understand the components that need to come together to do, to, to build technology businesses of the future. Um, and, um, and so everything that we're doing is about understanding what those components are and, and trying to, um, continuously improve. So in terms of a timeline, um, we, we sort of break down venture creation into three distinct elements. Um, similar to Dominic, I think. Uh, so we we start off with with venture design. This is where we are coming up with, um, the, and the output of venture design is a credible hypothesis of a business that should exist, and that takes three months. We're very very rigorous on timing, uh, and so we have distinct teams that sort of come together to 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 um, to do all of these things. Um, then we we have an investment committee where we have um, representation from whichever corporate LP um, that is, um, is relevant, and also Founders Factory. Um, we th that then gates us into the second part of the process, which is where we are uh, validating any final assumptions, building the MVP, and assembling the team. Um, then we have another stage gate where we decide to, or not to invest the spin-out capital, um, and then we take it through into a scale program where we're wrapping around other experts and helping to build out the org, um, ensure that the product and, and uh, go-to-market is humming and, um, and help it raise capital. Um, to give you a glimpse into a typical three-month journey across that first venture design part of the process, so we do a sort of double diamond design process where we're starting with a bunch of thematic areas that are particularly relevant to whichever partner we're working with. Um, we come up with a huge number of um, very low fidelity ideas. Um, and then with them, with experts, with subject matter experts, we start to validate those down into a short list um, of concepts. And we're going out and speaking to customers. We're, we're, we're testing different um, prototypes. We're um, trying to find um, propensity to pay and, and all of these kind of things. And then finally, when we come to that first investment committee, we're, we're bringing together what effectively resembles a pre-seed pitch deck. Um, and uh, often we've delivered technical product in a light fashion. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's how we do. As we get through that part of the process, the sort of key elements in that middle, that six months where we're building the venture. And again, very rigorous around timing. You know, we kick, we kick things off with our internal team. Um, we get an understanding of the founder attributes that we're looking for. We have a, a talent team that will then go out and help to find that founder. 
Um, they're doing that alongside domain experts that we have in the team. Um, we, we start to try and um, encourage the sort of uh, the, the ownership mindset in those founders as soon as they come. So it's their decisions that they're making and we're, we're sort of helping with those decisions. But if they think it should take a particular direction, we will challenge and put our view forward. But ultimately, this is their business that they're building. Um, midway through that process, we have uh, what we call a challenge session. If you're familiar with um, Creativity Inc., this is very similar to Disney's um, Brain Trust. And the whole purpose of that is to make this thing in front of us this, this concept, this venture, as good as it possibly can. So we have a lot of subject matter experts will, which will um, listen to and, and contribute to that. Um, we, we run regular retrospectives along the way where we're learning about how we are showing up to this venture, how the venture itself is performing. Um, and then we start to set really ambitious goals for that particular company. Um, and then we get it to the end of that process. And, and then we're launching it into our, our sort of set scale program. Um, in terms of why founders, why some of the best founders come, want to come and work with us. Um, so the founding team receives at the, at the point where this business is created and it's capitalized, 75% um, of the cap table. Um, and when we actually started off nine years ago, they were taking 25% of the cap table. We realized that that's probably not enough of an incentive to go out and do what is very, very a difficult thing. But in addition to that, they get obviously the validated design concepts and all the IP associated to that. Um, they get a build budget to um, including a, 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 a living wage salary. So we, we help to pay their salary. And that helps us to attract a very broad range of potential entrepreneurs, um, some of whom obviously would be put off by uh, that route. So we can help to, to cover their living costs. Um, and then we wrap around a team on the right hand side there, you sort of see the kind of roles and, and the proportion of time that we wrap around um, the founder or founding team. So at any point, we've got two full time members of Founders Factory, plus some specialist resource, which could be normally engineering, data science um, or, or other things. And then also the wider studio governance group. Um, and you can see the, the kind of rest of the uh, the elements. I think one thing here is is uh, unique to well, a, bit, a core part of the proposition is our ability to unlock things of value from large organizations like L'Oreal, uh, Media Banker, uh, Johnson & Johnson and others that uh, the, the founders' peers or competitors would find it really difficult to access were it not for someone like us in the middle. Um, and, um, and then as we, are, as we are running through this build process, we are assessing progress based on uh, a very transparent system, a uh, traffic light system. And that really encourages everyone to, well, it focuses everyone on what's important. And so by the point that we spin that out and inject the launch capital, transfer the IP into its own entity uh, and the team into that entity, we expect that there is more than one, more than one founder. Um, we expect that there's a product in market gathering feedback, if not revenue. Um, we have a very clearly validated vision uh, where we're achieving the objectives that we have set. And we've tested out the go-to-market and we're making moves there. And, um, and ideally, we have a viable business model as proven by, by paying customers. Um, some of the other kind of uh, rituals or, or like things that we put in place, you know, very close on, you know, on setting objectives, um, and which I guess is linked to that traffic light, um, every two weeks, we come together to hear about the problems that, you know, the sort of obstacles that the found, that, that team is facing. Um, and, um, and we do not want updates. Uh, we want to get together and solve problems. Um, so updates as kind of pre-reads. Um, the challenge session, I think, is a really interesting component of that process, which I've talked about, and then sort of retrospectives and, and looking back and uh, learning about how we're doing with that, as I said, how we're doing with that venture, how we're doing broadly with a studio as a product, um, trying to encapsulate and um, as much of that knowledge, if it's not in a, you know, a, a document, it's, it's encapsulated in a piece of technology so that we can repeat that easier next time. Um, some of the examples kind of recently 
recently built. Uh, so you can see the the range of disciplines and sectors that we operate in. Um, you know, we've got a lot of competence within fintech, deep tech, climate and health. Um, and some here, I'll just pick out maybe two or three. Byway is a flight-free holiday company in the travel sector. Um, raised a small amount of capital, but in January had a record-breaking month, um, two and a half X on year on year. Um, big partnerships, really interesting. Um, starting to look at international expansion as of now. And then Tembo, which is a um, family bank providing mortgages and, and um, savings and building on the concept of generational wealth transfer and the fact that trillions of dollars are locked up in aging populations and need to be, um, uh, and, and young people need help with buying properties. They just made their first acquisition. Actually, it was announced three days ago. Uh, they bought Nude, which is an I, um, ISA, a savings provider for um, to help people get on the property ladder. Um, and then finally, Dovetail, which is a, mod a data model that helps people to understand climate transition risk. So um, to, to price that into hedge funds and, um, uh, uh, and market analysts uh, and things like that. So it's a really broad spectrum of different businesses, but they all operate on those same rails. Um, whistle stop tour, but just to finish with this, what we've learned is absolutely critical to, as one is um, improving the, the, the venture, also improving the product of the venture studio. Um, and we've got people that will build internal software tools. Um, we try to use repeatable um, uh, snippets of code um, and, and everything is kind of written down and, uh, and not just existing in a, a handful of people's heads. Um, our constraints and speed, we think that those are really, really important. You know, the, 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 it's quite a, a, a difficult um, environment to, to, to be in when you're running at this kind of pace. But the constraints around capital, you know, broadly our cost of investment is about a million dollars. Just notice my thumb up. Um, and um, driving ultimate sort of focus and accountability with the team that is working with that, with that founder um, is, is super important. As I've heard before a number of times, it is obviously all about talent, and uh, we have a dedicated group of people that are um, trying, you know, constantly evaluating potential high-performing um, entrepreneurs. We've got communities of people that we want to build with, whether that's CTOs or, or potential CEOs. Um, and then the final thing is, it's very easy to settle on updates and get the, get the, the teams to come to you and say, hey, here's all the kind of stuff that we've done, but that's, that's not going to move stuff forward. And we want to roll our sleeves up and actually build with them and, and help them solve problems. And we think that that is um, incredibly important. That was a quick 11 minutes. I hope that was interesting. Love to answer any questions. Really interesting. Thank you so much. We actually have two questions at the moment. A uh, question from Max is, are all companies in the UK or do you also build companies in other locations? And if do, how do you manage it? Uh, so, no, all, all, we, we built companies all over the world. We've got, um, uh, I think the, the propaganda suggests that we've built companies on four continents. We've got investors, in, we've got operations in um Italy, Germany, the US, uh, across Africa, where I'm based in the UK uh, and Singapore, and um, and we we built or back ventures in in multiple markets. We sort of operate on a hybrid kind of hybrid basis. Um, if you are local to London, we do encourage kind of people getting together and, and working together. And I think that that is is really difficult actually building ventures where you have room. I found remote teams. So my preference is certainly to kind of be close to um to those individuals so that they can get to know the people that they're working with and and um and we can sort of solve solve problems a lot quicker yes great uh, damien thank you so much let's stick to only one question because we're <laughs> not uh, really good with the schedule today so thank you again and um so we're wrapping up today's conference actually and i want to Thank you to all of our nine amazing speakers for their insights and their stories. It's been two and a half hours rich in knowledge and not just from the speakers, but also from the books we mentioned. And I want to 
say that I had several questions during the conference. We will share the books from the chat, so don't worry. If you can't copy from here, don't worry, we will share, we will collect it all and share it with you next week. So stay tuned for the post. And uh, also don't forget to consider joining our Venture Studio family community. So now uh, it's time for us to say goodbye. And as a tradition, it would be really great if you could all turn on your cameras and say goodbye with actually microphone turned on. But for today, I have a really interesting idea. Be I, I guess that not all of us today are native English speakers. So if you are not, you can say goodbye in your native language. Or if you know another language, also just use that. Okay, so let's do it. Everyone, goodbye. Bye. 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 Спасибо, что пришли. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Thank you for the great presentation. Grazie di essere venuti. Ciao dall'Italia. Ah, look at that. Thank you, Max, and the team. Great hosting, Max, Sasha, and Annie. And Diana, thank you. Thanks Diana and Jake. I love the presentation more. Thank you so much. Ciao. Ambiente. Ciao dall'Italia.